Hello? Can anybody hear me? I can't hear anybody. I can hear you. Oh, that's all right. Oh, we can hear you, It's 6 30 on thursday the 16th of july 2020 and we are commencing the meeting of the full council at basingstoke and dean i'm councillor diane taylor mayor of basingstoke and dean and i'll be chairing this meeting welcome to all councillors participants and viewers to this council meeting it's being streamed live on youtube and would also be available to view after the meeting is finished the revised procedure for virtual meetings is the same as last month's first virtual meeting, which went quite well. So just to reiterate one or two key points. Um, first of all, councillors are identified by name on the screen and I will introduce them by name before they address the council. Councillors who wish to speak should use the raise hand button and switch this off when they have spoken. I'm content for councillors to interrupt without using the raise hand button only if they have a point of order or a point of personal explanation to raise. Can councillors please ensure that their mobile phones are now switched off or are on silent, along with any other devices that could interfere with the proceedings? Thank you. Councillors should turn on their video link during the meeting and keep their microphones muted unless um, they have been invited to speak. As far as agreeing recommendations is concerned, I can't, as is the usual way, visually check that all councillors are happy with the recommendation. I'll therefore, following the introduction of the item, ask if there is any dissent which would prompt a debate. If no, no one raises their virtual hands to indicate dissent, I will take it that we can agree the recommendation without discussion. Obviously, if there is dissent, we will debate and vote as usual. Voting will, as mentioned last time, be taken by a roll call 
and before voting commences, all councillors will be asked to turn their microphones on. Each councillor will then be asked to indicate whether they are for or against the motion or recommendation, or whether they wish to abstain. And once their vote has been cast, councillors should switch their microphones off. Officers present will only switch their video link on during the proceedings when they are presenting or where they wish to be invited to speak by me as chair. That's the preamble. Um, now, as is customary, may I invite the Mayor's Chaplain, Dr Andy Taylor, to say a few words and pray. Councillors who do not wish to take part in this item may, of course, switch off their sound. Thank you. Good evening. Can you uh, hear me? Can you hear? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Good evening to you all. Um, one of the things that's uh, really dominated the news, apart from the lockdown and the pandemic, has been the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the subsequent um, wave of protest uh, against racism that swept the Western world and continues to do so. Um, we've had protests in our own town and Maria Miller, our MP, has been conducting an inquiry into uh, the experience of BAME community people locally. Um, to be honest, when all this began, I thought that there's not a lot of racism, racism in Basingstoke. I've got lots of uh, friends in different uh, cultures, different religions, and it seems quite a peaceful place. But as I began to ask a few questions of BAME folk that I know, all people that would normally not complain about anything, I was shocked at the stories that started to come out. Um, one of the things I observed was that in certain situations, a person's response is going to be strongly affected by their previous experiences. So, for instance, one person who has not experienced much racism, a mildly thoughtless comment can be brushed off, whilst to another person that same comment can be deeply hurtful. So, um, there's a lot of uh, understanding that we need to uh, we need to get both from both sides of the discussion actually, and I've had to examine myself and my motives. Um, I recognise this on my public persona, which you can see here now, which is presented in, in a way that uh, I present what I, what I think you want to see of me. It's my public persona. And uh, I'll, there'll probably be quite a lot of political correctness in there. And then there's a more private place that only our close family and friends see. And then there's that deeper place in our inner being that only we and God knows. That's a place where real change begins. So I've just got three one-liners from the Bible to tell us, to help us in, in um, how God really wants us to behave. If you believe in God, that is. Matthew 7 verse 12, it says, so in everything do to others what you have them, what you would have them do to you. For this sums up all the law and the prophets. That's the so-called golden rule that transcends all religions and philosophies. Then the second one's Romans 12, verse 10. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. And finally, in Philippians 2, verse 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Let's just pray. Father God, I just want to thank you for our town. It's a great town. We love to live in it and we want to serve it. We want it to be the best place in the country to live in. Um, but for some, we recognise it's not such a happy place due to the actions and attitudes of others. Father, we just pray that you will help us in this town to make sure that things like racism and to be honest, a lot of other isms that are around, that they will not be prevalent amongst our community. That Lord, out of respect and love for one another, um, our town, we won't be able to make our town a place which is really is open and honest and a, a lovely place to live for anyone who comes here and wants to be part of it. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, let's move on now to the first item on tonight's agenda, which is to receive apologies for absence. Uh, Councillor Rattigan, could you unmute and let me know if there are any apologies from your group? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I believe there are, are no apologies this evening and everyone will be attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor Ruth Cooper, uh, sadly, is uh, still unwell, recovered from the virus. And uh, Sean Keating will join us shortly if he hasn't joined us already. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tilbury. Oh, hello. yes. As far as I'm aware, there's no one missing tonight, so no apologies. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Councillor Gavin James. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor. As far as I know, no one's supposed to be missing this meeting, so anyone who can't get in is because they're having technical difficulties. Oh, Excellent. OK, thank you very much, everyone. That's fine. Um, next, we'll just go on to declarations of interest. Um, can you indicate electronically if you wish to declare an interest in any item on the agenda? <laughs> Councillor Vox, I think you have something to say. Yes, please, Madam Mayor. I was trying to find the little hand. <laughs> um, with reference to item eight on the agenda and for reasons of transparency, I declare that I'm a board member of the Housing Association to Saints Limited. I'm advised this does not affect my participation in the item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Yes, Madam Mayor, can you hear me? Councillor Fillmore. I can, yes. Thank you, Councillor. Um, 20 questions from members of the council on notice. I'm a board member of Bainstock Town Community Football Club. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm actually um, speaking on behalf of Councillor Carolyn Waldridge, who's having trouble getting her mic to work. Um, she wants to declare an interest as a Housing Association employee on item eight. Thank you very much. And I'm assuming the same applies as to Councillor Vox, that she's still allowed to participate in the debate. Yes. OK. Yes, I have a nod from our legal expert behind me. So thank you very much. That's the declaration of interest. So we'll move on now to item three. Minutes of the meeting held on the 25th of June, the council meeting. These can be found on pages nine to 26 of the agenda book. Uh, unless anybody has a hand to raise, I'll move this from the chair. Seconded. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Cubitt. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to some announcements. Um, can I invite our Chief Executive, Mel Barris, if you'd like to say something, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I will be leaving Basingstoke and Dean next month after five years, and I've been reflecting on what we have achieved together uh, during that time. Let me start by paying tribute to all my colleagues who have worked so hard during this COVID-19 pandemic to maintain essential services, to support our most vulnerable citizens and to support our local businesses. This has been a fantastic team effort of which we can all be proud. It is perhaps no coincidence that in the recently published Local Government Association COVID-19 workbook guidance for councillors, which applies across England, Basingstoke and Dean is referenced no less than three times in terms of examples of good practice during COVID-19. At the time of my interview, um, five and a half years ago, the recruitment agency specifically brought to my attention the issue of member officer relationships including the LGA peer review conducted in 2013 in relation to the council and concluded that member officer relationships were suboptimal and holding the council back. I've put a lot of time into ensuring that all members can feel supported and was gratified that a revised member officer protocol building on best practice from the LGA and elsewhere 
was agreed unanimously at full council. And notwithstanding some bumps in the road, the partnership between members and officers has been improved. And Madam Mayor, at your Christmas drinks reception following last December's full council meeting, there was a tremendous demonstration of everyone coming together, which was great to see. Basingstoke and Dean Borough Council is ambitious for its place and ambitious for its people. However, there was some work to be done in the early days uh, with the administration in terms of encouraging a sharper focus as to priorities so that staff could be clearer about the things that mattered most and could marshal their efforts to deliver against those priorities, supported by effective managers to make a real difference on the ground. Feedback from staff and residents has been resoundingly clear. The first internal staff survey some 18 months into my tenure showed improvement across 90% of the performance indicators measured. And shortly afterwards, we won Hampshire Inspire's Employer of the Year Award across both the public and private sector. In 2018, we recorded the highest score for a staff survey of any local authority that participated in the Best Companies Index as featured in the Sunday Times. And we repeated that score in 2020. This high level of staff satisfaction has translated directly into extremely high levels of resident satisfaction on how both the council runs things at 80% and satisfaction with the, council, with the borough as a place to live at 95%. These figures are way above averages for local government and we should all be proud of them. During my time here, we have supported the council to bring together a range of opportunities and to turn them into a compelling four billion pound investment and development program to support increased growth and prosperity of the borough into the medium and long term. This investment and development program led to the council and Basingstoke winning the Thames Valley Property Awards uh, across Thames Valley. I do not underestimate the challenge of promoting and accepting growth. The challenge of moving from a discussion around the generalities to a discussion around the site specific. And I've sought to imbue in my officer colleagues the notion that engagement, challenge and scrutiny should be welcomed as a means of trying to ensure that the council can be in a position to make the best possible decisions. Many Down has a long and complex history well before my time. I am pleased that after many, many years, the council has finally got this over the line in terms of securing an outline planning consent. This is a very exciting project for the borough's future. And my thanks to a range of officers who have worked diligently and transparently along the way and have been unstinting in their support of members. This moment perhaps provides an opportunity for all those who want to make the borough all it can be to engage and seek to positively shape the development moving forwards to positively shape and engage rather than to focus on looking in the rear view mirror. As a council, we have delivered the first new grade A office space at Basing View in over 15 years. And in a recent catch up meeting with the chief executive of Sovereign Housing Association, he reminded me that I introduced the opportunity to him and was pleased to confirm to me that they've now moved into the building and renamed it Sovereign House. A great achievement for us in terms of citing their HQ on Basing View. And clearly we have Eli Lilly following close behind with their new HQ, together with the Village Hotel restaurant and hotel, breathing new mixed use life into Basing View. These are all significant achievements for the borough and I am pleased to have played my part. I have also been pleased at the extent to which our voice and our opinion is valued by others 
and we have run active campaigns for additional investment in infrastructure and recently health infrastructure. And at the moment, significant investment in a new hospital is potentially within the council's grasp. As I prepare to leave, it seems that local government reorganization may be coming back onto the agenda. During discussions a few years ago on a potential combined authority for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight and potential local government reorganization, it was both pleasing and humbling to be asked by the chief executives and leaders of 13 other local authorities to personally lead that work on identifying options for local government reform within Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. The work delivered in that regard has been acknowledged as exemplary and of the highest quality and provides a great starting point should it be required to be dusted off in the future. And finally, Madam Mayor, I have valued my time as electoral registration and returning officer, ensuring that the process of democratic renewal is run effectively in which the public can have confidence. And it's massively important that we have achieved year on year improvements and have been cited as an area of best practice by the Electoral Commission. However, one thing that has proved to be beyond my ability to deliver is the much awaited all out election following the electoral review of electoral wards. Uh, initially, this was as a result of concerns about the process followed by the Local Government Boundary Commission for England, which meant that we missed our May 2019 slot. And then clearly this year, a postponement as a result of COVID, which brings me full circle. COVID is where I started. Madam Mayor, Leader of the Council, Leader Emeritus, councillors and officer colleagues, it has been my tremendous privilege to serve as your chief executive for these last five years. I wish you every success and all the very best for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And you will be so missed, you really will. Um, now I believe Councillor Rattigan, would you like to say a few words? And thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you, Mel, for your, your words. I'm delighted to be able to express my thanks to Mel before his departure. Having shared quality time with Mel, I'm struck by how much he has reminded me of the great West Indian cricket captain, Clive Lloyd. Mel metaphorically arrived at the crease here in Basingstoke when there were poor, poor overhead conditions, a turning pitch and difficult opponents. But he took his time to play himself in, to weigh up the opposition, understand the ground conditions and play with a straight bat. He has fended off many difficult deliveries, even negotiating a number of bouncers, some of those delivered by us as members. He knew when to be defensive and when to strike the ball to the boundary. But more than that, like every great captain, he understood that he could not be the best in every position. So his role was to bring out the best in others. Thus, he looked to surround himself with a team that could deliver for this borough. Like any great cricketing captain, he spent long hours in the net, coaching, mentoring, shaping others to be better than they were before they had the benefit of Mel's time and experience. One of his lasting legacies will be the team that remains on the field when he has left the ground. He has fostered captains of the future. Rebecca Emmett, Sue Curden, Ian Bowl, Sarah Cragg, Ruth Ormella, Fiona Thompson. He leaves a stronger team than when he arrived. Mel himself is honest and calm and admits when things have not gone right through the match and where substitutions have had to be made. Perhaps because of his heritage, he does not take himself too seriously. He has a laid back, non-controversial approach. He listens before judgment, but most of all, he cares about others around him and is sensitive to criticism. As he walks back to the pavilion at the close of his innings, we should stand up and applaud, also recognizing his contribution that he has made to our match. He may go to another place that will benefit 
from the input of us here in Basingstoke into that leader, Mel Barrett. We will go on to have many other captains of this borough, but no one will be another Mel. Thank you very much indeed, Ken. Thank you. That was lovely. Um, Councillor Putty, you have your hand raised. Would you like to speak? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to pay tribute to Mel for the support that he has given me throughout. And there was one of the projects that we actually undertook in which he was very supportive was to support the Basingstoke Hindu Society in their search for a Mandir site. And I hope that this particular project is not going to fade away after his departure. I just hope that uh, I'd like to thank him for that. And also uh, on behalf of my, uh, uh, the residents of uh, Hatchwaran and Beggarwood, uh, who were delighted to see him on his visit to the wards. They were really very pleased and they were proud to see that a chief executive is coming over to visit the, the lovely place of Hatchwar and, and Beggarwood. So I would like to say a thank you on behalf of my resident to Mel and I wish him all the very best to whatever he is going to do in Nottingham. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor Pussy. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Isaac, would you like to say something? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Uh, I would like to say a few words of appreciation about our departing uh, Chief Executive. I worked closely with Mel uh, over the last five years and uh, quickly realised the borough had been fortunate to appoint a capable and wise new Chief Officer. Local democracy here in Basingstoke is often fiery and sometimes very bruising. Uh, Mel has always demonstrated objectivity, integrity and calmness under fire and just as importantly firm resolution. He's now got the grey hairs to prove it. It made me reflect on occasions that uh, the diplomatic services loss was our gain. As an advisor, Mel brought highly relevant experience and insights that were frequently invaluable in helping to deliver the council's priorities, including the much needed new investment in jobs and housing now being realized. Around the table, Mel had a great ability to steer us from inconclusive debate on complex issues to sound, well-reasoned ways forward. He's an intelligent solution finder. He also has a good sense of humour, which is just as well, really. I wish Mel success in the big new role he has accepted at Nottingham. Basing State will have prepared him well for most eventualities. Mel, you have played a pivotal role in helping to make this borough a great place to live and work today. And I'm certain that our residents will be beneficiaries of your good work for many years into the future. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you, Councillor Isaac. Um, Councillor Sanders and then Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I don't want to prolong this eulogy indefinitely. It'll, you can see his, his head swelling already. Um, I, as somebody, I suppose, who's probably spent more time with him than almost anybody else um, over the years, um, together as Chief Exec and as leader, um, and sharing the, the thick and the thin, as we might call it, as we went through things. I mean, the one thing which just comes across is he's a really nice guy. He just is a, a really nice guy who you enjoy spending time with, who plays a completely straight bat, which is very unusual in the world of local government. Um, and it's the result of, it's very clear to be seen in the way that the council's improved during his tenure. Um, it's a great loss. But we always knew he'd go in the end because he's capable of doing a bigger and better job. And I'm very pleased that we've been that stepping stone towards him getting it. And I also, as, along with everybody else, wish him the absolute best of luck 
wherever it is is going. I've forgotten now, but I think it's somewhere like somewhere up in the Midlands, isn't it? Nottingham or somewhere, I think. Good luck, Mel. Yes, it is Nottingham. And um, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, on behalf of uh, the group, um, Mel, I'd like to wish you all the best in your move to Nottingham. And uh, you're going on to a, a unitary authority, a, a, a very big authority uh, compared to Basingstoke. Uh, so uh, in that regard, I'm pleased you're moving on to uh, bigger and better things. And I wish you all the best in your new role. Thank you very much. Councillor Gavin James. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to thank Mel for his uh, support and advice and guidance over the years in his time as Chief Executive. Of course, I, I was part of his recruitment panel, and I think I'm the only group leader who's been to every single group leaders meeting since he's been Chief Executive. Um, I must admit, in all that time, I've spent all my effort trying to get rid of the administration, so I'm gutted. I've actually got rid of the Chief Executive instead. Uh, but there we go. Uh, I, I will get better at that. Uh, in future. Good luck in Nottingham. Um, obviously, you leave Basingstoke with a slight football crisis. I can say as a Nottingham Forest supporter, please don't do the same in, in Nottingham. Um, we need all the help we can get in the playoffs. Uh, but thank you for all your guidance and support. Best wishes in Nottingham. And if you are at the city ground and you get a few free tickets you don't know what to do with, you've got my number. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see no more hands raised. So um, I'll just continue. This is the announcement section, as you know. I've just got uh, three announcements to make myself and the first is uh, just to echo all that um, my fellow councillors have said on the departure of our chief executive. I don't have any sporting metaphors but it has been a real pleasure to work alongside him particularly during my time as mayor. He's always been ready to offer wisdom and experience both in and out of council meetings and I shall really really miss that. It's been a great confidence booster to have a chief executive who knows the ropes and is ready and willing to come alongside to help and advise. You really will be greatly missed now, certainly by me. Secondly, I've just got another announcement to make, and that is, can you please spread the word about the big thank you week that will be taking place from the 10th to the 14th of August? We want to hear from as many people as possible about the people and organizations who've stepped up and done great works of service during the pandemic, so that we can give them a proper thank you. The deadline for nominations is the end of this month. Just Google the big Basingstoke thank you or similar and you'll find ways to send in your submissions. So please spread that word. We want to hear also from under 18s, individual schools and youth groups who can use their creative skills such as art or poetry or writing, music, craft, I don't know, whatever you can think of, to depict the subject of kindness. Everything is going to be displayed on the big Basingstoke and Dean Thank You website as a lasting memory of how our borough coped and helped over these past months. And finally, finally, although I can't physically present awards this evening, there are three current councillors who are to be congratulated on achieving 20 years of service in this council. They are Councillor Warwick Lovegrove, Councillor Sean Keating and Councillor Gary Watts. Many congratulations to you all. And there's also a public service award for former councillor Venetia Rowland, who joined us in 2016 and has recently moved away from Basingstoke. Congratulations to all of them. And I'm sure you three councillors, Lovegrove, Keating and Watts, will get something in the future. I'm not quite sure what you get for that, but we'll find out when we meet again. Well done. Right, moving on, um, our next section on the agenda is questions from members of the public. We have limited time for this, so just be aware of that as you ask your questions and answer them. Uh, we've got three questions. Can I first welcome Sheila Peacock? Would you like to unmute your microphone and put your question to the Cabinet Member for Planning, Infrastructure and the Natural Environment? Thank you, Sheila. Madam Mayor, I believe that um, Sheila Peacock has not uh, attended the meeting. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll move on to the second one. If um, I may ask Miranda Chubb, uh, would you like to put your question to the Cabinet Member for Planning in and Infrastructure, and I believe possibly also the Cabinet Member for the Environment and Enforcement? Thank you, Ms Chubb. Uh, yes, if you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. 
Great. Uh, this question concerns Agenda Item 17, the Climate Emergency SPD. Um, I would like to know how, without a supplementary planning document to address the climate emergency within our local plan, the Council thinks that it will be possible to make the urgent changes required to meet our current commitments. These include Basingstoke Council's commitment to be a carbon neutral borough by 2030, also the Horizon 2050 vision commitment to reduce carbon emissions and to ensure that the use of renewable energy will be prevalent and that the borough will generate the energy it uses. Chapter 14 of the National Planning Policy Framework states that the planning system should help to shape places in ways that contribute to radical reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Plans should take a proactive approach to mitigating and adapting to climate change in line with the objectives and provisions of the Climate Change Act from 2008. However, to date, there have not been the necessary steps taken to ensure that new buildings are constructed to carbon zero standards. Also, only 2% of the energy used within Basingstoke is from renewable sources. It seems we're not on track to be carbon neutral by 2030. So it is imperative to increase the production of renewable energy and to ensure any new developments are built to carbon neutral standards. Without urgently changing our local plan, it seems nothing will change. Thank you very much, um, Madam Mayor. Thank you for that. Um, Councillor Othell, are you going to take this one? I am. Councillor Eaches, over to you. Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the Bower Council unanimously supported the declaration of a climate emergency last summer, and I am committed to working with my Cabinet colleagues to meet the ambitious targets set out in that declaration statement. As such, we have commissioned consultants to support us in identifying what actions we need to take as an authority to tackle our own emissions and to reduce emissions across the wider borough through our role in influencing and enabling residents and also our partners to take actions to reduce emissions. The output of this work will be a draft climate change and air quality strategy, which I will be taking to the Community Environment and Partnership Committee in September to seek their views on the proposed strategy and actions contained in it prior to consulting more widely with residents and interested parties. A key element of our admissions links to new homes and development more generally, and there is clearly a role for the local plan update in this respect and ensuring that policies in our new plan secure higher standards than in the past. This area generally rests with my colleague, Councillor Mark Raffel, and I will be working closely with him to develop policies that meet our ambitions and meet the requirements that have been outlined this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms Chubb, do you have a supplementary question you'd like to ask or is that sufficient for you? Um, that's very helpful. I would just like to say um, Norwich City Council have already built over 100 council houses to passive house carbon zero standards and I look forward to the new higher standards being um, included in this plan to encompass uh, similar developments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now I understand that Sheila Peacock has now arrived. If you're there Sheila would you like to put your question please? Hello, yes, this is Sheila Peacock. Um, my question concerns item 17, the Climate Emergency SPD, uh, placed by councillors Tomlin and Ashfield. The motion is worded, if passed, would lead to a yes or no answer, i.e. it is or it isn't viable to create an SPD within six months. So if the motion's passed, will the council portfolio holder for planning, infrastructure and environment please explain clearly to a subsequent full council the reasoning behind the ultimate yes or no decision, taking into account the Council's climate emergency policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Councillor Raffel. Madam Mayor, I'll answer the question now rather than in the future. Uh, the position is you can't create an SPD unless there's a policy in the current local plan, full stop. There's no compromise on that, that's the law. So we can't create an SPD in line with our current local plan. But this motion, which we'll discuss in due course, has uh, many benefits. In other words, if we, if we pass it, we'll be able to discuss creating an SPD as well as obviously the overall policies in time for the local plan update. 
so that if an SPD is required, we're already engaging in that discussion forthwith, rather than delaying until the local plan update takes place. So the answer to the question is we can't do it because that's the, that's the law, but we can prepare for it and we can do some other things which I'll talk about later in the meantime. Thank you very much. Is, is that sufficient, Sheila? Would you like to ask anything else? No, that's fine. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, finally, there's another question for Councillor Fell from Martin Heath. Welcome, Mr Heath, and would you read your question? Is Mr Heath there? And if so, can you unmute and ask your question if you're there? Yes, Madam Mayor, I, indeed I am. I hope you can, I hope you can yes, hear me. We can hear you, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I think just, uh, it was just a year ago, I think nearly to the day actually, that uh, this very chamber declared a climate emergency. Indeed, I, I was at that meeting. Um, and then of course in February, 2020, an update the meeting uh, was always held. I was at that meeting as well. And the opening statement there was our changing climate is a significant threat to us all and we need to take urgent, urgent action to respond in order to stop harming the planet. And I think, you know, in, since February or since last year, how things have changed. And I think there's a, a, a perfect example of how an emergency can over, overwhelm us if we don't react rapidly to, to a, a, an emerging situation. My concern is we are not really reacting anywhere near quickly enough to the, the emergency, the climate emergency we now face. We're now a year closer to 2030. Very little has happened in that previous, that current year. Uh, the current approach, as we've just heard from, from the previous uh, councillor, is to do not much more than revise the local plan, perhaps by 2030, if we're lucky. But we're in an emergency. Uh, the IPC has made it absolutely clear that if we're going to limit global warming to just 1.5% uh, 1.5 degrees, which in itself is significant, was going to require rapid and far-reaching transitions. Uh, we would need, on a global basis, to cut CO2 levels by 45% from the 2010 levels. And that means us in the West having to get to something like zero um, carbon by 2030. Yeah, so in so we, we need rapid and far-reaching transition. Yet our response to date has been to, oh, let's have another plan, or let's have another plan, let's have another plan. Uh, we just haven't got the time to wait to 2023. Now, our current local plan is based on evidence that the, at best was collected seven years ago. It hardly mentions climate change. Indeed, even in parts, it actively prevents the introduction of renewable energy technology into our borough. That's our current uh, local plan. It allows developers to build inefficient homes. It allows them to build offices and warehouses and factories with, with nothing more than a passing mention of their impact on our climate. Mr. Heath, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, we've very limited time for questions. Okay. Um, I wonder if you could move on to the actual question. Indeed. I mean, as we, you. we said, we've got a serious air pollution problem as well. So three questions, really. Um, you know, given that the, we all agree that the current local plan is no longer fit for purpose, what's the preference of, of the council? Is it to issue a new local plan in 2023 at the earliest? Is it to amend the existing one via a supplementary planning document so we can take action on climate change now? And uh, you know, if and how do you justify the choice between either the long, slow process of issuing a new plan in two to three years' time, or amending the existing one within the next twelve months? Many thanks. Thank you very much, Councillor Fell. Uh, Madam Mayor, can I thank Mr. Heath for his question? As he knows that uh, my approach has been to meet with him already and other groups to discuss the, these important issues. And uh, whilst there are many things he may say in rather bold language, which I disagree with, there are obviously many good things he's also saying, which I will take away and work with. Uh, and he understands from me that he is not the only voice that I'm listening to. There are many others within the borough who have different views, but all designed to pull us in the same direction to try and solve these problems. I, I would like to say to him that to suggest this local plan is just as similar to the old one is balderdash 
it is going to be different in the sense that it will have like a golden thread running through it what we need to do with climate change and in terms of uh, his first sentence we all agree the current local plan is it, we don't all agree that it is uh, well um, understood by developers by the planning inspectorate and on every other level that our current local plan is for, fit for purpose the only matter that it's missing which is why we're having this discussion is the fact that it, when it was formed he, uh, the the population of Basingstoke and Dean wasn't jumping up and down about climate change then but are now and that's why we're going to introduce this policy within our updated local plan um, I let's hope we do issue answer question one a new local plan in 2023 we can't amend the existing one via an SPD as I've already explained it just can't be done they are the, that's the law of the land it's not about us being difficult we can't do it and of course there are various statutory uh, um, tests and, and applications that have to be gone through when you publish a, or update in a local plan we can't just sort of magically do one by crowding the officers into a room and having lots of late night council meetings it, it doesn't happen like that we have to consult publicly and for it to have the binding force that he and all of us want it to have in due course so uh, the answer to question two is um, no and the answer to question three um, well I justify it because it's the law of the land and as I will say in the motion uh, debate coming up uh, let's hope there are other things we can do in the meantime to, tr to bridge the gap Thank you very much. Is that okay, Mr Heath? Would you ask, like to ask a brief supplementary? Yeah, I'll keep it brief. Yeah, I'll, I'll just point out to, to all councillors, actually, there were many, many people in the population of Basingstoke who made the, the issue of climate change uh, very clear in the last local plan. It's just that we were ignored. So we, we've made our point many, many times in the past. I do appreciate, actually, Councillor Raphael and all the other councillors and officers who have met with us. And I, just, I would like to say that and put that on record. He, he has spent a lot of time with us trying to move it forward. But I'm, I'm not really sure if we've really answered the question. Um, it, it looks like the answer is basically no. We are going to wait to 2023 until we do anything about climate change. And does, does, the, does this chamber really think waiting to 2023 is is good enough and quick enough thank you thank you councillor Fell. would you like to give a very brief answer to that well the answer to those two things is two answers one is in terms of the local plan the answer is yes we are waiting to 2023 unless it comes sooner uh, and the answer in terms of uh, how we think about climate change and deal with planning applications going forward in the light of it uh, will be that from this very moment, and indeed the Development Control Committee, I think has already demonstrated its concern over uh, climate change issues in recent planning applications and will continue to do so. So no way is everyone throwing their hands up in the air and saying doing nothing until 2023. It's quite the opposite. We're doing as much as we possibly can, instructing consultants to advise us, dealing with the issues that we can, and then the local plan will come in and give uh, force to the decisions we make in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you all for all the questions and answers. Uh, we now move on to item six. We have no petitions as far as I know. Nobody has come forward with one. So item seven, resignations and appointments. Um, I'll just go through these really quickly, just um, for clarity. I'll be asking each of the leaders. Uh, first of all, the committees. Councillor Rattigan, do you propose any changes? Uh, no changes to committees. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councillor McCormick. No, Madam Mayor. Councillor Tilbury. Oh, no, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And Councillor Gavin James, any changes to committees? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. And just looking at the outside bodies, which can be found at agenda item seven on page 27, can you raise your virtual hand if you wish to propose someone for either of the two current vacancies? That's Basingstoke Music Festival Committee and Hall of the Arts. Any hands raised? And are there any hands raised from people who wish to resign from one of the outside bodies? Nope, okay, I see no hands. So everything as was, and we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the Housing and the Homelessness Strategy 2020 to 2024. And this is a recommendation from a cabinet meeting held on the 7th of July and can be found on pages 29 to 
90 of the agenda and it is for approval and adoption of the strategy. Councillor Tristan Robinson, would you like to introduce us, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, before I start, on a very brief point of order, I believe that all members were informed that we should not have political slogans on our backgrounds. And if I think it would be important if we kept to that so that people didn't get the impression that they could put up whatever they want behind them. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. I'm just in the process of getting some advice on that. So if we could just proceed in the meantime, that would be ideal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This new ambitious housing and homelessness strategy paves the way for the future housing provision in our borough. Whether you are a family looking to bid on your first property through the housing register, a rough sleeper looking to take their first steps into safe and secure accommodation, or a first time buyer trying to get onto the property ladder, this council is committed to helping get you ahead. The housing strategy builds on the progress and the achievements made by the last one and has opportunity at its heart. The 2016-2020 strategy made strident achievements, particularly in relation to increasing affordable housing delivery and reducing rough sleeping. Across the council, we have a target of at least 300 affordable homes delivered per year. And I'm pleased to confirm tonight that over the last four years, on average, we've delivered 322 affordable homes per year. That's 322 more affordable homes every year since 2016-17, giving people the safety and security that a home of their own brings. Our main aims of this strategy are preventing homelessness, eradicating rough sleeping, delivering housing choice and quality, tackling climate change and place shaping. In terms of preventing homelessness and eradicating rough sleeping through the innovative partnership working, and commitment by people across the town, rough sleeping has reduced by 81% in our borough since 2016. This is a fantastic achievement, but we have much more to do. And a key part of this new housing strategy is to eradicate rough sleeping in Basingstoke and Dean by 2024. We will work tirelessly to make this happen with officers, housing associations, and other organizations such as May Place, the Camrose, Julian House, and others. We're looking to introduce a housing first type scheme and are very close to confirming a new single person's homeless shelter for our town. We must always strive for housing quality and housing choice. Rented or owner occupied, we want to ensure people have the homes that are fit for the future. Last year, we introduced the council's own home loan, a landmark scheme whereby young people can borrow up to 30,000 pounds to help them get onto the property ladder and we have a number of successful applicants going through the relevant checks as we speak. We've also seen 966 properties come forward for choice based lettings in the last year, over 70% of which were for social rent. I look forward to influencing the new local plan and look forward to bringing forward more socially rented homes rather than just affordable rented homes for our residents. Tackling climate change and placemaking is something members rightly are very passionate about, and we've heard about that already this evening. We must ensure that we don't just build homes, but create the communities for the future with sustainability at their heart. I'm delighted to be working with Councillor Isaac on the regeneration of the Winklebury Centre, and I look forward to this strategy not only informing the new local plan, but also to working with Councillor Fell on the new development charter for Basingstoke and Dean, setting out what we believe is the exemplar standards developers should strive to when building homes in our borough, including carbon neutrality and increased biodiversity. I would like to thank our hardworking housing team for their work in creating this document. The strategy has been out for public consultation and builds on the things that residents have told us are important to them. It was welcomed by members at EPH and approved by the Cabinet, and I look forward to members supporting it tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do we have somebody seconding that? Councillor Frost, I believe. Councillor Frost, do you want to speak now? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. No, I'd like to uh, reserve my right, please. Thank you very much. I have a hand from Councillor Finnamore. Yes, Madam Mayor, thanks very much. Um, it's difficult not to support the homeless element of this strategy and all those involved should be commended for the homeless element involved. However, 
the strategy does not go far enough to help people on lower incomes gain access to housing. We are told in Appendix 3 that social rent is still predominant and on the rise and waiting times have reduced to a still unacceptable 18 months to two years. Appendix 4 states that an average private rental for a two bedroom property is £875 per month. So how does someone manage to save for a deposit while private rent costs take up a large proportion of their income while being excluded from the opportunity of social housing? The council's in-house equity loan only helps a narrow group of potential home owners. Shelter research shows that starter homes are unaffordable for households on the living wage in 98% of the country. We cannot record a vote of thanks later in this agenda for those key workers who until recently we applauded on a Thursday evening without providing them with genuinely affordable homes. In a post COVID-19 world, as the recession starts to bite and with unemployment set to rise, this council needs to recognise that things don't have to be the same. This council needs to take back control of its housing policy the current housing policy is broken. The dogmatic approach to getting on the housing ladder is not for everyone. The housing ladder in itself perpetuates inflation with its reliance on ever increasing house values, which increasingly prevent entry from the younger generation. The reliance on the private sector to build homes, or the lack of it, has cost us. Certainly in terms of the threat of unwanted and overdevelopment, in Bramley, Oakley, Overton and Wichita amongst others. Developers are riding roughshod over the local and neighbourhood plans. The council should return to a programme of social housing with all the benefit that it accrues, fiscal and social. As argued previously, investment in social housing will provide a better return on the council's investment the probable reduction in housing benefits and emergency housing accommodation. Madam Mayor, the coronavirus crisis has shown the willingness to, to look out for each other. So as the task of rebuilding our, our economy begins, we need to ensure no one is left behind. If there was ever a need for the Prime Minister's renewed commitment to levelling up, it's in housing, but not at the expense of the countryside. Thank you very much. Councillor Gavin James. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not going to get into the debate about how we need more social housing and must build more homes, but not in Overton or, or in areas where we, we live. Uh, that's clearly a debate for another day. What is important, I think, is looking on the uh, homeless. Obviously, this paper originally went for EPH long before uh, the pandemic was recognised by the government, um, certainly in terms of attending meetings. And when the government um, the pandemic hit, the government announced we will do whatever it takes. And as we know with Conservatives, that generally means we'll take whatever we can. And so we spent a lot of money on getting the homeless off the streets. So we've got a strategy that says we'll achieve that in four years. Actually, we managed to do it in about four days after the lockdown, which is a fantastic achievement. Uh, and I, I'm grateful to our officers for doing that. But what it has taught us is it's possible. And I appreciate it's not been always worked out well. And I appreciate some of the hotels and B&Bs we've used now want to return to being hotels and B&Bs. But I think we've got very used to the idea that homelessness is unacceptable. And I think the strategy to have a four year target to get rid of rough sleeping is no longer the ambitious target it may have seemed back in January, February when this went through committee. So I think whilst I agree with the strategy, clearly any strategy can be improved and hopefully our policies and actual outcomes will exceed the strategy. You have to have a strategy as a starting point. I think on the homeless thing, I'd like to learn a lot more about how we're never going to go back to having people sleeping rough in Basingstoke. We've proven during the pandemic we can do it. Uh, and I think it's great if we can keep that, keep our streets tidy and make sure that no one's ever has to live on the streets again. Thank you very much. Councillor Konieski. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to echo that. I'm part of the EPH committee that scrutinised this document earlier on this year. And as we all know, a lot has changed since then. Just a few months ago, we offered all rough sleepers in our borough a safe and secure place to stay. And that's a huge achievement. And our council officers, the social inclusion partnership, our housing associations, and everyone else involved in, in that enormous effort deserve our gratitude. It shows just how much we can collectively achieve when the chips are down and that where there's a real desire to do something. Where there's a will, there's very definitely a way. 
But let's not allow ourselves to slip backwards now that the pressure has started to ease off. We as a borough council can permanently end rough sleeping in our borough right now in 2020, not in 2024. We know we can do it because, well, we've done it once already. So why are we extending the pain, the misery and the hardship for those on our streets for four more years? Are we going to stand by as homeless people return to our streets? Can we not push ourselves just that little bit harder, be truly ambitious and pledge to end the scourge of rough housing, to, uh, of rough sleeping today? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Frost, I've got two more speakers. Um, do you want to speak now or wait till after they've spoken? I'll have to wait until after they've spoken. Madam okay, Mayor. thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tilbury. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I don't want to say too much. I mean, I don't have a problem with the strategy generally. The problem is, as I think um, my colleague has alluded to, the problem is we're not building houses. That's the problem. There's no point in having a housing, a housing strategy that doesn't involve us building housing isn't much of a strategy. And to put this into context, when I joined this council in 2002, 73% of the people in the borough lived in the right house they owned or were buying. 18% lived in social housing and 7% lived in private rented housing. Look at the figures now in this report. The number of homeowners has fallen to 68%. Those in social housing has remained the same because largely whether we've built more, we've sold more off. But look at the, the real changes. 13% now live in private rented accommodation. Insecure we've increased the amount of insecure accommodation, reduced the number of homeowners. I mean, whatever strategy we've been pursuing for the last 15 years, it's clearly not working for homeowners. It's not really working for people in social housing. And as for the people in the private rental sector, they're going to be stuck there forever at this rate. And if you look at the real problem, it isn't that we don't want houses. We've had no problem having houses built in Overton. When we get them, we tend to get flats that are unsuitable for families. So they're of no use. So we end up with people who actually want to be in Basingstoke, work in Basingstoke, are being pushed out to over and they've had the same problem in Bramley and other areas. If you look back to 1970, when we were run by the Kingston and Woodchurch Rural District Council, they were building 210 houses in 1970. They were a sixth of the size of Basingstoke and Dean. You know, we'd have to be building 1300 houses a year now to compete with the level of house building by a rural council. Obviously, Basingstoke was building far more because of the, uh, the London overspill and the new town, but we are not building houses for the people that need them that they can afford to live in. Because the biggest change is, of course, we've lost so many of those properties. We're not gonna get them back. And unless we build them, nothing is gonna change, is it? If you build houses, they're not gonna fall in cost. That, that remains the same or keeps going up. And we're likely to see the biggest recession we We've seen in our life here, we're dealing with properly. We are made problem. The private rental sector will go to the roof, more people in insecure accommodation. There'll be even more people on the streets. And isn't it interesting that we can suddenly take people off the streets when we think they're a they're a threat to our health? We should have done this years ago. It, can, it clearly we know it can be done. It's just finding a way to deal with it. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Councillor Waldridge. Can you unmute Councillor Waldridge? Are you there? All right. I think I've got there. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, we, yeah. we've got you. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, firstly, I'd, I'd really like to uh, uh, say thank you to the officers who produced this document. Uh, I know a lot of work has gone in, hard work has gone into it. I would generally like to offer my support to the strategy, uh, although I do share some of the reservations expressed by others today about uh, a lack of ambition in, in some areas, uh, especially given uh, what's been, uh, you know, proven over the last, uh, what, that can be achieved over the last few months in terms of um, uh, eradicating um, homeless, uh, homelessness on the streets. Um, I, I'm really I'm pleased that uh, the portfolio holder uh, and officers have, have listened to the feedback that uh, members have given at EPH and um, in other consultation events, and that they've actually included the, the feedback from members uh, in the strategy. So they have actually changed the strategy to listen to feedback, which is good. 
in particular in relation to um, the social rented target, um, the uh, commitment to work with uh, registered providers on making the best use of um, adaptations. And, uh, you know, the, the, I, I know it was already in the pipeline, but the, absolutely the commitment to look at an, an emergency hostel provision, a new emergency hostel provision. Although, as we've just said, things have moved on, on a bit now and it would be lovely not to, to need such a thing. Um, and also the emphasis on, uh, well, not the emphasis, but at least the inclusion on empty homes work, which wasn't in the last strategy at all. Um, I'd also just like to take the opportunity for the work, you know, to acknowledge the work of the housing team in the, the course of the last strategy. They, they've done a, an, an amazing job really and in the work they've done with partners and, and voluntary sectors in uh, in uh, in sort of uh, eradicating well not eradicating but really sort of denting the amount of rust sleepers we've got on the streets um, and and working with the churches uh, in the winter night like shelter provision they've done that for three or four years now and it's been a tremendous success um, and uh, you know I know that their creativity and partnership working shown by the team. Is, is excellent so I'd just like to to acknowledge that today really uh, so that's it really so thank you very much but generally I'd like to support the strategy but have reservations about lack, lack of ambition in some areas so thank you. Thank you very much um, we've got Councillor Harvey and then Councillor Frost to do the second speech so Councillor Harvey. Thank you Madam Mayor can I thank the cabinet member for introducing the paper and can I thank the officers for the work that's got into producing it I recognise, I don't want to repeat what colleagues have said, which I agree with, particularly the points on homelessness, particularly the points around what we can and should be doing as, as a local authority to make the difference on sites that we own, on sites that we directly influence. Because while having the socially rented target is welcome, and I do hear what the cabinet member says, and it is very welcome considering the years we have debated it in this chamber and had the, uh, the conversation year on year on year that hasn't resulted with it on the ground. So I guess that's my actual point. Question. We have the strategy. It is a piece of paper that has an aspiration in it. We have a target and we have land we own. We have land we seek to influence through the planning process. The proof of this is going to be in the delivery. So the challenge to the cabinet is just how serious are you at intervening on our land, on land we seek to influence through planning to actually get the socially rented housing on the ground. I welcome the words. I really, really do. And I welcome the strategy. The question now is, can we deliver on it for all those residents in our borough that genuinely want to see socially rented housing and other forms of housing? It's not the, but it's absolutely critical. But the point about the private rented is important because a lot of those residents who would benefit from socially rented housing are trapped in private rented accommodation. And I do mean trapped in it and to find, I find very difficult ways out into housing that would then suit their needs because many of them are trapped in private rented housing that does not suit their needs. Once they're off the register and they're gone, they're off the register and gone. So in that context, how we support people and get the right housing that meets our community's needs is really important. So I welcome the paper, but the challenge is actually going to be in the bricks and mortar that we're able to build over the next 10 years or so with a local plan and in terms of the life of this policy. So thank you, but the challenge is going to be in that. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Frost. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm pleased to second this uh, um, housing and uh, homeless strategy uh, paper, which sets out the strategic way forward that this administration proposes to follow, uh, using the following priorities, preventing homelessness, eradicating uh, rough sleeping, uh, increasing housing choice and quality, tackling climate change and future-proofing housing, and also place shaping. This strategy built on the success of the 2016 uh, to 2020 housing and homelessness strategy, where we have seen rough sleeping in the, the borough fall by 81% since 2016 through a use of a uh, comprehensive range of trailblazing initiatives. We have seen the affordable housing um, being delivered in greater numbers. Note that uh, roughly 40% affordable housing is, is it roughly equivalent to 300 dwellings. In 2018 and 19, we delivered 414 dwellings. And in 2019, 2020, we have delivered 494 dwellings. We have helped and continue to help residents access housing with our own home loan scheme, 
and I'm pleased to know that residents are going through the appraisal process um, uh, and, uh, uh, and along with the, the twice annual help to buy events where over 1000 households have accessed help and advice since these events began. Finally, I'm really pleased that this strategy will help um, home single people uh, across the borough access accommodation, encouraging access to HMOs through our housing association partners. I am pleased and proud to support this strategy paper and I urge every councillor to do so. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Frost. Uh, would Councillor Robinson now like to sum up, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor, and thank you to members um, for their broad support this evening, particularly to those on EPH, it's like Councillor Waldridge and Councillor Harvey. Um, I think we had a very good debate at EPH, and I think hopefully while not agreeing with everything that's in the strategy and perhaps wanting it to be stronger in certain places, we had a good debate and it was we've made sure that we've edited the strategy to take into account your feedback, particularly in regards to social rent. Um, on Councillor Harvey's point about social rented homes in our local plan policy, I agree we should be stronger as a council in telling developers what we what we want and what we want to see. And I'm hoping we'll be able to do that through the development charter. But also what this housing strategy will do will it'll help inform the local plan review. And hopefully as part of that local plan review, we can come to a better policy than we have currently in terms of CM1, where we can stipulate more social and indeed, I'd like to stipulate um, more affordable home ownership as well. That won't come as a surprise to members, um, but that's what I think we should be doing. Um, I completely agree with what every member said about ending rough sleeping by 2024 and that there's no cliff edge for vulnerable individuals. Councillor Konechko is right that we have supported people throughout the pandemic. And if we can end rough sleeping sooner, that is absolutely what we will do. But what we need to recognise is it's not always just about a roof over people's heads. It's about that wraparound support. I've committed as portfolio holder that every person who is sleeping rough received safe and secure accommodation. They received that offer. Those who've taken up that offer, that's absolutely fantastic. Those offers remain now that we're at, now that we're coming out of COVID. They will not be taken away. There will be no cliff edge. And what I'm hoping is that that will have been the tool to get people to engage and that we can end rough sleeping for good in our borough. I was disappointed with the remarks um, from the members, uh, the Democratic Republic of Overton and elsewhere, where they're saying that we need more homes that people can afford. I agree, we do need more homes that people can afford and the council's pioneering the own home loan to help young people into, into housing. They're saying we need more social rent and to reduce waiting times. I completely agree. And that's why we're, what we're delivering with more homes. 966 homes on the choice based letting system last year, 70 percent at social rent. And Councillor Frost read out the numbers on broader affordable rent. What's disappointing is then to see the argument against more homes in their district. As Councillor Tilbury said, 270 homes delivered in 1970 by Overton Rural Council. If it's the right thing to do for residents then, and if it's the right thing to do for residents now, we can't always object to it in our own backyards. You know, I suffer from it too in Sherburn St John, and I've almost uniquely gone to committee for a scheme in my ward that wasn't in the local plan that was providing smaller units for people to get onto the housing ladder and supported it. We've got to be consistent, and if we believe providing smaller, more affordable units is the right thing to do, then we need to do it, even if it is in our own backyards. Thank you very much, um, members, and hopefully we support the strategy and we can end rough sleeping by 2024. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I now pass over to officers for a vote on this issue, please? It is obviously to approve and adopt the strategy. Thank you, officers. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going to read out the roll call of members and if you could vote for, against or abstain. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Ashfield. Mm. Count, count. 
sorry, Councillor, are you on mute? Councillor Ashfield? Okay, she's not Excuse there. me, Madam Mayor, to make things uh, go a bit smoothly, can all councillors please unmute Mute. their microphones? Yeah. Okay, ready for the roll call? That would be superb. Thank you. Um, I don't think she's present at the moment. So, Councillor Bean? Four. Councillor Michael Bound? Four. Councillor Simon Bound? Four. Councillor Capon? Four. Councillor Carruthers? Four. Councillor Cooper? Oh, absent, sorry. Councillor Court? Four. Councillor Cousins? Four. Councillor Cubitt? Four. Councillor Eaches? Four. Councillor Edwards? Four. Councillor Faulkner? Four. Councillor Jane Frankham? Four. Councillor Paul Frankham? Four. Councillor Freeman? Four. Councillor Frost? Four. Councillor Gardner? Four. Councillor Gaskell? Four. Councillor George? Four. Councillor Godson? Four. Councillor Golding? Four. Councillor Grant? Four. Councillor Harvey? Four. Councillor Hickling? Four. Councillor Hussey? Four. Councillor Isaac? Four. Councillor Gavin James? Four. Councillor Laura James? Four. Councillor Kuzneko? Four. Councillor Kinnear? Four. Councillor Jones? Four. Councillor Keating? Four. Councillor Leakes? Four. Councillor Lovegrove? Four. Councillor McCormick? Four. Councillor McKay? Four. Councillor Mahaffey? Four. Councillor Miller? Four. Councillor Fillimore? Four. Councillor Potter? Four. Councillor Putty? Four. Councillor Regan? Four. Councillor Reed? Four. Councillor Rattigan? Four. Councillor Nick Robinson? Wake up. Councillor Nick Robinson. <laughs> Councillor Tristan Robinson. Four. Councillor Raphael. Four. Councillor Sanders. Four. Councillor Still. Four. Councillor Diane Taylor. Four. Councillor Kim Taylor. Four. Councillor Mark Taylor. Four. Councillor Tilbury. Four. Councillor Tomlin. Four. Councillor Vox. Four. Councillor Watts. Not present. Councillor Westbrook. Sorry, Councillor Janet Westbrook. Four. No. Councillor Michael Westbrook. Four. Councillor Wooldridge. Four. Four. Like... <laughs> sorry, I think, sorry, Councillor Ashfield, I think might be back. Four. Thank you. Sorry. I'm here, Councillor Watts. I'm four. So, Councillor Watts. <laughs> Councillor Nick Robinson, is he present? No. He was two minutes ago. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you. I could have saved myself that, couldn't I? Everybody is for it. So that's unanimously carried. Thank you very much. Um, just before we move on to the next item on the agenda, I just want to address the issue of backdrops to our screens. Um, if I could just read out... Um, 24 conventions of full council from our constitution. It says this, no person shall distribute or display advertisements or literature promoting the activities of any political party at meetings of council. So therefore, whilst the Black Lives Matter organization doesn't describe itself as a political organization, um, I couldn't object to that, but um, I do think pictures of party leaders isn't appropriate. So if I could ask you to be very careful what your backdrops are, and um, we've perhaps discussed that outside of the meeting as well. So please be aware that we do need to be very careful that um, we don't put 
wrong backdrops or distracting backdrops or ones that are just not allowed in our constitution. Thank you very much. Right, moving on to item nine. This is the Basing View 5G Living Lab. And this report can be found on pages 91 to 104 of the agenda papers. And the recommendation from the cabinet is in four parts as listed on page 91. Councillor Bean, would you like to introduce this and propose it? Um, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to recommend this report to Council this evening to add the Basing View 5G Living, Living Lab to the Capital Programme. Um, this project's been a long time in the making and officers should be recognised for their hard work in bringing this to fruition and indeed my predecessor, Councillor Golding. Um, this really is something we should be very proud of. Basingstoke is already well recognised as a top tech town and performing well when it comes to the digital sector. We have a vibrant and growing tech community and the delivery of a 5G living lab will only seek to enhance this. Being awarded up to 1.9 million of local growth funding from the M3 LEP is also testament to our town being recognised as forward thinking and ahead of the curve when it comes to digital tech. This innovative project will create a 5G commercialization living lab in the Basin View Enterprise Zone, which will enable startups, SMEs, and larger businesses to trial products, services, and applications and bring these to market faster. Unlike other 5G test beds, the focus is not on research on 5G technology, but on business growth. It will put the Basingstoke and the M3 LEP area firmly on the digital tech map by creating a 5G centre of excellence underpinned by groundbreaking research at the University of Surrey 5G Innovation Centre and commercialisation expertise in the Basingview Living Lab. I hope you will all join me this evening in supporting this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Bean. Um, do we have somebody who'd like to second that, please? Yes, Madam Mayor, I would. Thank you, Councillor Golding. Uh, do you want to speak? No, I'll, I'll reserve my right, thank you. Okay, um, I have one hand up, Councillor Ryan Hickling. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, so first off, I mean, I'd like to start by commending the ideas behind this project, uh, as I'm fully in support of any initiatives that will help drive uh, technical innovation within the borough and obviously the potential economic benefits that those may bring. Um, I am, however, a little concerned around the usefulness uh, of the creation and particularly the maintenance of a private 5G network within just Bayes and View, uh, especially when we have 5G rollout uh, nationally at the moment. Um, a major selling point of any living lab is ultimately to provide access to functionality uh, or equipment in an open environment that's either unavailable or perhaps difficult to obtain. Now, had the project, specifically the 5G part, uh, arrived even one to two years earlier, uh, I'd have felt a lot more confident in its potential success. Um, the report itself uh, states in 2.7 uh, that the long-term sustainability of the project is dependent on the monetization of said 5G network. Now, with national 5G obviously available elsewhere and continuing its rollout, surely this can only help to reduce the lab's value. Um, now, a couple of other points of concern on the report. Page 93, 2.6, uh, states that both projects must be completed by September next year, but fails to state why. Now, I'm assuming this has something to do with funding or contractual obligations, uh, but I don't think it's mentioned anywhere. Secondly, on page 95, in what I think is supposed to be 2.13, uh, it mentions of delays to the European Regional Development Fund application. Uh, what are the impacts here if we fail to secure uh, that European funding, especially before the end of the year? Uh, if the answer to that is we're planning on relying on the withdrawal agreement with the EU to cover the potential cost of losing access to EU funding, uh, surely that sounds like a bit of a gamble to me. Uh, and finally, what if any scrutiny uh, has been done over this proposal so far, uh, and will this be brought before a committee to, uh, for review once the procurement process has been completed? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hickling. Um, I've just lost my participant screen, but I believe 
obviously, that there's nobody else who has their hand up to speak. Sorry? Oh, Cuts, sorry, Councillor Sanders. Sorry, Madam Mayor, I forgot to press my little button. Um, I think it's very sad if we take such a cautious view about such a potentially fantastic opportunity that we have here. We have been working with the University of Surrey and with the LEP for at least eight or nine years now on trying to bring forward 5G as a workable commodity for business to be able to use. We were the first to have an emulator on Basing View so that uh, some of our local businesses could start to develop their own apps to be used in uh, on that network. Um, there is already a lot of interest amongst local businesses to try and um, utilize the kind of facilities that will be provided through this um, through this initiative. Therefore, I, I would really strongly urge everyone to support it in that it gives us the potential to take a step ahead of many of our neighboring towns, uh, in fact, many towns up and down the country to really put our, a mark down as being a leader in this type of technology. It might be um, a local network of 5G, but it will at least be a, a 5G network on Basing View within the locality. Uh, and that's going to be significantly years uh, in front of when we're likely to get 5G being rolled out to Basingstoke. The concentration will be inevitably on the major cities over the next few years to get 5G. Basingstoke may come quite a way down that list of priorities. Uh, so from that point of view, all of our local businesses will be denied the type of access that this facility will provide. You don't often get opportunities like this come along for such a radical change and 5G does provide a really radical change in, in what it is able to do. It's not just about being able to talk to your fridge. Uh, there's all sorts of other technologies which can be dependent upon it, uh, like autonomous vehicles, all sorts of other things that can come into play as a result of having um, this opportunity. And I would therefore strongly urge everyone to vote in favour of it, particularly as it's not actually spending any of the council's money. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I would give this a, a, a cautious welcome. Um, I wouldn't want us to get too carried away with the fact that we are um, an especially um, praiseworthy tech town. I think we still have a long way to go uh, when you compare where we are with places like Cambridge. Um, there really is very little in the way of comparison but it is good to see uh, an initiative that will address one of the problems in attracting or keeping tech firms in the town, which is um, bandwidth. Um, if we were truly um, a good place for tech terms to do business, we would have much better internet access. We would have much more uh, user friendly in terms of tech businesses, uh, broadband access, fiber optic, you name it, you know, very high bandwidth. Um, we don't have that as yet. Um, a lot of firms have moved out. If you compare the number of tech jobs we have in Basingstoke now, compared to where we were maybe 20, 25 years ago, when we still had IBM and many thousands of tech jobs, Smith's Industries, Sony, Motorola, some of these are still here, but with a much reduced presence. I think that speaks volumes in terms of where, where we need to go and how long away we have to go. But this is a promising start. And if we can get the broadband infrastructure right, uh, then we stand a very good chance of attracting tech firms coming out of London, uh, because the trend now is to move away from London and uh, you know our transport links are good, uh, so if we get this right, that makes us a much more attractive place for tech firms to do business. Thank you very much. Um, now, slightly later in the day, I understand that that was Councillor Hickling's maiden speech, and a very good one it was too. So well done. Silent applause. You would have heard it if we'd been in the council chamber. So well done.
Um, right, I don't have any more speakers, and I think probably I just need to gauge if there's any dissent on this one so that we don't go to an unnecessary vote. So first of all, um, Councillor Hickling, were you dissenting? Are you going to vote against this? Uh, I'm for. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm told Councillor Golding wants to speak, yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I didn't want to miss my opportunity to second this, even if nobody's um, going to vote against it. Um, I am really pleased to see this um, paper come forward. Um, as Councillor Bean has hinted at already, this project idea started while it was still in my portfolio. And I'm so glad to see that the work has continued and the project has developed to this stage. This 5G Living Lab really will offer something different for our local businesses and they are ready to take advantage of this. So I'm quite sad to see others talk down the status of Basingstoke as a top, top tech town. It's not something that we as a council decided we were, it's an externally measured and awarded status um, and that's based on current statistics and not, not how we were 10 years ago. Um, we really shouldn't talk down or underestimate the technology firms that are already in our town or how many of our small businesses and startups are tech focused and really thriving. Basingstoke is a great place to be a tech startup. Um, and I personally want to see that continue. And I think this, this project is exactly the sort of thing that will give small businesses like that a, a unique selling point. Um, 5G that we see now being rolled out isn't really the full final product yet. Um, and that's why this 5G Living Lab is gonna still have real value. Um, there's still uh, the software is developing and it's much more about how you are using the bandwidth and the, the software behind in the cells um, to kind of stream your data more efficiently than it is just about putting up new masks in places. Um, and, and that's why I'm happy to support this. Um, I also think it's great that we're seeing um, new companies coming in to invest in this lab and invest in our business di district. Um, so in summary, Madam Mayor, you may also appreciate that I'm always glad to see papers come forward um, where we can do great things with other people's money and not our own. Um, and so for that reason, as well as the huge benefits that I believe this will bring our local business and economy, I will be supporting this paper. Thank you very much, Councillor Building. Councillor Bean, would you like to sum up? Yes, um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I mean, really, um, just to echo some of the words that have been, have been said already, um, I had hoped that this would be received as a totally um, positive um, paper this evening. So it was disappointing, um, some of the comments from some councillors. Um, I think just to, to summarise, this is a fantastic opportunity we should not talk down our town. We have been recognised as a top tech town. Um, there are businesses out there that are eager for us um, to implement this and, and for it to come to fruition. And as stated already, we're not paying for this either. Um, and I think, again, just in summary, um, Councillor Hinkling, you asked quite, quite a number of um, questions on the paper. So if there is anything further you would like outside of this council meeting, then, then please just drop me an email and I can come back to you with, with whatever information you need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so whilst comments have been made, I don't detect that um, anybody is going to vote against this. Could I ask you please to raise your hand if you've got a problem with it and you want to vote against it, otherwise we will take it as passed. No, no hands raised. Therefore, um, that recommendation is accepted. Thank you very much indeed. Moving on now to item 10, the capital programme outturn for 2019-2020. Um, this report can be found on pages 105 to 128 of the agenda papers. As you can see from the agenda, there are seven points to note and two to approve, i.e. the programme itself and the addition of £14,000 to the revised capital programme in the next two years. And that's as shown on page 110 and at appendix five of the paper. Um, now, can I ask Councillor Golding if you would explain this and introduce it, please? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will explain it, but I will also be brief. Uh, the capital programme strategy looks at how the council finances allocate and manages capital investment into services that are vital for supporting the development of a successful and vibrant borough. 
The report demonstrates how we have spent in accordance to our strategy in the past financial year. Uh, as many are aware, the economic climate in the past year has been challenging, although I think we'll all agree this year has brought some fresh challenges. Uh, but we have been able to finance that commitment through the Council's track re record of strong financial resilience and management. The outturn report for 2019-20 shows an underspend of just 4.68% for the year, which is comprised of £0.142 million of advance spend, £1.391 million of slippage and a small net overspend of £0.003 million. The total spend on the capital programme for 2019-20 was £25.381 million. This figure demonstrates the strength of commitment of this council to invest in facilities that matter to our residents. It includes, but is not limited to, sports and recreation improvements, adaptations that enable disabled people to live well at home, parking improvements in local areas and play areas renovations. This vital investment work for local communities will continue during this coming financial year with nearly £40 million capital investment proposed with the updated um, additions that Council are asked to approve tonight. And therefore, I would urge Council to approve this report this evening. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Bean, are you seconding this? Um, yes, I'm happy to second this. And do you wish to speak? Um, I will reserve my right to speak if that's okay, please. Thank you. Councillor Vox. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I was delighted to see the borough uh, continuing to invest in sports facilities. As a keen tennis player, I was heartened to note the upgrading of four of the six outside hard tennis courts in Stratton Park, including new lighting for two courts. Tadley also has a community tennis court maintained by Tadley Town Council through the Turbury Allotment Charity, which is investing in lighting to enable play on the court and adjacent mugger all year round. As the mayor and councillors will be aware, with our current coronavirus pandemic, Tennis has been classified as one of the safest sports to play by following some simple social distancing and hand hygiene rules. During the winter months, when outside exercise is severely restricted with short daylight hours, to be able to play tennis under lights will be particularly welcome by residents in Basingstoke and Tadley. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. I don't see any more hands raised. So, Councillor Bean, would you like to speak? Um, yep, of course. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I will be very brief. So, I'm pleased to second the paper this evening. Um, our continued capital investments are something we should be proud of. Um, we continue to improve our residents' quality of life and enhance our facilities. Um, I do wish, however, to particularly call out how this report demonstrates our continued investment to sports and sporting facilities to help drive up participation and residents' access to high quality sporting facilities. It sees £350,000 being invested in our athletics track, for example. It also asks for approval for future spending at Downgrange, the Aquadrome and the Town Centre. Um, and on that basis, I'm pleased to support the capital programme outturn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Golding, do you want to say anything else by way of summing up? No, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, so again, um, if you, I, I, I don't detect any dissent, but obviously you're perfectly entitled to. So if, if you would like us to go for a vote because you're not going to vote for it, would you mind just uh, raising your virtual hand so that we know? Okay, thank you very much. Therefore, that recommendation is noted and the programme approved. Thank you very much. Uh, item 11 is the Treasury Management Annual Report for 2019-2020. And this is an officer report to be noted and can be found on pages 129 to 144 of the papers. I don't know if anybody wishes to comment. If they don't, I would be very happy to propose it from the chair. And I'm to second it. Okay, so that's okay. It's 
proposed and seconded. Thank you Roger, very much indeed. Roger Gardner. Oh. Councillor Gardner. I think I'm unmuted. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Fine. I, I was seconding the the motion, but um, it did go through audit and accounts, and there were some, I wouldn't say concerns, but some items we raised. When we had the original report, um, we asked for the risk register entries to be added to the report, as I've always had problems with the standard risk paragraph, which is frankly a bit bland and not always informative, as if there is no risk, it could at least tell us that, but telling us that there might be risks and they might be mitigated um, doesn't really help. So adding the risk register entries was a great ad ad addition. In terms of short-term loans, we were concerned that loans lent over six months at the moment might be a little bit risky in terms of security and liquidity as the liquidity could well be used within the borough and there could well be security problems if the councils we were lending to weren't liquid at the time, especially under the COVID problems. Um, and lastly, we were concerned that while they are short term for us, they might well be long term for other authorities. And we were, we're having a report back which will go over the last five years as to which authorities we have lent to, and if there are any which are repeated borrowing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologise that I missed your hand. I think it must have been an actual hand and you weren't on my screen, so apologies for that. I'm sure your comments have been noted and thank you for making them. Uh, we'll now move on to item 12, special urgency decisions. Um, this is information for noting and can be found on pages 145 to 155 on the agenda papers. And it will be no surprise to anyone that there have been quite a few such decisions during the last quarter. In fact, eight listed on page 147 and all related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, does the leader wish to say anything? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think the report speaks for itself. I hope that um, the members of the council will, will note it. Obviously, we do not use these uh, these powers indiscriminately, and and coming back to you as a full council uh, allows you to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. But I thank you for your your patience on this matter. Uh, I know it's been raised with with others already. I am happy that the report sits as it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see no hands, so I will propose. Oh, sorry. Councillor McCormick. Andrew McCormick wants to speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm sure this is a question that other councillors will wish to ask. Um, you know, we, we live in, in such times as emergency decisions need to be made. The impact of COVID on the, on the borough has been immense. Um, just one of those decisions, suspend weekly waste collections. Do we have an indication when we'll go back to weekly waste collections? Uh, I'm, I'm, happy to, to, I'm happy to take that if you want me to. Thank you, portfolio holder. I was going to refer only be, to you anyway. Sorry, only because I've had a meeting today. Um, yeah, so we did set a date uh, for mid-July, mid to late July, to review the fortnightly collections during the pandemic. I have met with officers. Uh, actually this week and again today and we are now working with Serco to set the earliest date possible for returning to weekly collections and I um, will commit to providing you with a further update in the next week or so when this has been determined. Thank you very much. We have a bonus question but that is allowed so thank you very much indeed. Councillor Frankham. So just, a, just a quick one. As chair of scrutiny, all these papers came in front of me to make sure that, 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 that there were reasons for behind every decision, uh, so that I and I had to agree the, to removal of the call in on them. So they don't just the cabinet don't just pass them through the leader. They do go through some checks and balances. And I, I just want to say that I did agree all these papers, 
after a lot of uh, discussion with officers and, and advice from the officers. So I'd like to thank them as well for all their help doing that. Thank you very much, Councillor Frank, and that's actually very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, I think we can take this then as noted. Thank you very much. Right. Moving on to item 13, interim cover arrangements for the Chief Executive and Head of Paid Service. Um, we know that he's going. So whilst the recruitment process to find a new Chief Executive is taking place, this recommendation for interim cover can be found on pages 151 to 156. Does anybody wish to speak, Councillor Rattigan? Would you like to say anything to this? Uh, um, I just uh, endorse the papers that are in front of you. Uh, I'm delighted that we will go through a very rigorous process to get a new Chief Executive. As I have alluded to earlier in this meeting, I have much respect for our former or current uh, Chief Executive. Uh, and I know that the process will be, will be rigorous. Um, I just want to, to say that we've managed to get, to get Ian Bold to step up as acting Chief Executive in the period that we don't have a substantive uh, chief exec, uh, and I'm sure with the support of other officers around him, he will do an excellent job for us as a council. Thank you very much. I see no comments, so um, I will propose that this is approved. Thank you very much. Moving on to item 14, the annual overview and scrutiny report for 2019 to 2020 pages 157 to 182. This is for noting. If there are no comments, I will move it. And my colleague sitting with me will second it, I'm sure. Seconded. Thank you very much. No hands raised. Right, the next item um, is also very straightforward. It's the dispensation consideration. Um, we all know that uh, Councillor Ruth Cooper has been very unwell and has been unable to attend a council meeting since February the 27th. Um, this means that on the 27th of August, the statutory six months of non-attendance would mean that she would cease to remain in her position unless dispensation is granted. I'm sure you all agree um, with this one. As slight apologies for one or two of the typos in the report. Um, so I will just make it clear that we, the dispensation that we are approving would run from August the 27th, 2020, or six months. I don't think I'll probably see any hands objecting to that. So may I move it, please? Yes. Thank I'll you. I'll second it. Thank you very much. And once again, we do wish um, the councillor well. I hope she recovers quickly. Now we have um, some motions. So let's move on to motion one, which is concerning rights of access. And obviously, please indicate electronically if you, if you wish to speak on this motion. Uh, can I invite Councillor Tilbury to introduce and propose this, please? Councillor Tilbury. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, hopefully it's fairly self-explanatory from the motion. What prompted this is we've had this, ironically, this is one of the first cases I ever dealt with back in 2002 when I became a councillor. The individual who lived in this house at that time had had uh, issues with their neighbours and the access and there's some confusion over as to what had actually happened and it was never really resolved and so it wasn't with any great surprise when I was contacted by Councillor Fillimore last year he'd been contacted by another tenant who would suddenly found that the neighbours next door had sadly died and the um the family was selling it and said, well, well, actually, we don't want this access across the garden anymore. We're going to take the fence, take the gate out, block it off and put a fence panel in there. And you'll have to put your wheelie bins in your front garden. Now, obviously, these houses were built back in 1947 by Kingsclear and Whitchurch Rural District Council, Councillor Robinson, not Overton Rural District Council. We'd never had that sort of power. In fact, we didn't even get a name check in the name, did we? And this, what they were built in 1947. So from 1947 till 1989, obviously no problem. The only access to the rear gardens of these properties is via this footpath. The rear of the property backs onto the main line, the Waterloo line. So obviously that's not a way of getting out if there's any, if there's a fire or any, any issues like that. There is only one way out of these properties. There's, there's five blocks in this little estate there that are like this in Overton, in this particular one there all have exactly the same access arrangement, work perfectly. 
The house was sold under the right to buy in 1989. So this is what, what concerns me. This was quite a way into the right to buy. It wasn't, you know, one of the first ones sold, it was an error, it was missed, you know, or we, we weren't aware of these sort of access arrangements. This was done relatively late in the day. It was sold in 1989 and the tenants carried on. The council tenants who bought the house carried on as normal. The people who lived next door carried on taking their bins out, taking the lawnmower around or anything to get in their garden. And they've got quite large gardens. It's, I mean, it's getting on for a quarter of an acre, I would have thought, said these properties. They were very generous in those days. So they needed to be able to get in there and get the bins out and all that. That carried on. Then it was sold in 1994. And at that point, it was flagged up by the buyer solicitors. And what happened then is uh, seems to be a bit contentious and I won't go into the details of that, but this, so this has then gone on at that point there. And of course, now it's come to the point where they can't do it. It's caused obviously considerable distress to the people who live in the property now and to their neighbors. So they've had a lot of support from the neighbors and you may have actually seen it in the Gazette last year in the Andover Advertiser. There was a report there and it culminated in one of the neighbors, a retired vicar who's 90, I believe, actually tearing the fence panel down and taking the law into his own out, a bit of divine intervention there. Uh, and unfortunately that obviously caused all sorts of problems there. The, the fence panel was replaced, complete new fence put in. So there's no, actually no access to the rear garden of this property. You know, you couldn't even get a ladder in there to clean the windows or repair it now, because you can't go through the house because the layout is such that you can't do that. But the, the, this is the only one I've come across in Overton, but. I am aware the same access arrangements exist across lots of other properties in Over and former council properties. I mean, they exist on private ones. I lived in a house like that myself. The first, well, the first houses I bought in Over was like that, had a rear access that was shared all the way through. But that was there, it was sort of on the property deeds. For whatever reason, this wasn't put on there. It's clearly an oversight. And hopefully, it, with any luck, it's the only one. But given the thousands of houses that were built, across the borough using these sort of access arrangements. I suspect not, and I suspect like this, it will only get picked up when they're sold. I've mean, actually got a copy of the conveyance here, 11 pages of it. You thought somewhere in there they'd managed to squeeze in the rights of the next door neighbor, wouldn't you? But no, there's all sorts of stuff in there and it was just missed. But if it was missed in 1989, presumably by the borough solicitors, probably services department at that time, They've been selling them off certainly since the early 80s and before that, you know, and there was houses being sold off in the 70s. So it's only when these properties are sold that people realise because the people just carry on with their lives. Who has ever read their conveyance? Very few people. People don't take a lot of notice of these things until things go wrong. So hopefully if we can support this, if, we, if there's nothing we can do, you know, but ultimately the housing association are unable to act because they were not the people who dealt with it at the time. They've tried to deal with this come up with various solutions or potential solutions but ultimately the council made this error and I think it's down to the council to do its best to put it right now rather belatedly but it's got a lot of times gone by now but if we can do that I'd, I'd, I'd be grateful if you could support that because you may find the same problem coming up in your own ward anytime soon thank you madam mayor thank you very much indeed councillor Tilbury um I madam. don't have any other speakers so Yes, who, who was interrupting me there? That was uh, Councillor Rattigan. Can I just yeah. say that we will look into all of these and we will pass a note around the parish councils. I feel slightly responsible as you mentioned Kingsclere and Whitchurch Council, uh, but I will do something with our legal team to make sure that we, we troll our papers if we can on title that gives no access to, to rears of properties. All right, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fillimore, as the seconder, would you like to speak, please? Yes, Madam Mayor, I'd just like to thank um, Councillor Rattigan uh, for that um, uh, gracious intervention. Um, Councillor Tilbury and I are only doing what we're elected to do, is that is represent our residents. Thank you very much. Um, I'm detecting unanimity here that um, a report should be prepared for cabinet to consider legal action on this. Um, if anybody is unhappy with us passing this motion, would they raise their virtual hand or their actual hand now? No, okay, thank you. So that motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the second motion, um, subject to climate emergency. Again, do ind indicate electronically if possible, if you wish to speak. 
Uh, can I invite Councillor Tomlin to introduce and propose this, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, time is running out. 2030 is fast approaching. And we, the borough, have pledged Basingstoke to be carbon neutral by 2030. We have to achieve a lot in a very short time. Back in 2012, when I became a councillor for the first time, as part of a think tank, I had suggested we look at initiatives in Europe and provide solar panels to generate electricity on covers over our council-owned car parks. We could see then a financial income from such initiatives uh, as a bonus. Eight years on, we have not progressed anything like this, but we have some panels now fitted to parklands. We have opportunities to help us with gaining carbon neutrality. As members will read, we currently only generate 2% of our electrical consumption from renewable means. The new homes, the factories and shopping centres that we are going to see built over the next few years must be carbon neutral or at least be able to be upgraded easily. Many of these will only just be finished before the deadline. So it's imperative that they are constructed in a way to help us. Passive homes and offices, water saving and embracing renewable technologies. Many could actually generate power for some of the thousands of homes that we are building. How about actually using the waste heat from our rubbish burner in Chinham? on the planned local housing in the immediate area. We are lucky in the borough. We are passionate and knowledgeable people who can help us with technologies and solutions. They have models that show we could consider using the roofs of our buildings for solar power, for example, to power local communities and with a good rate of return on our investment, better than the pathetic interest rates that are currently available. We should welcome their input with open arms. We need all the help we can get. It's so much easier to embrace this technology from the start rather than to retrofit it later. I have first-hand experience with this as currently I have a new uh, building project at home and I put solar panels on my roof. They reduce the number of tiles I've had to buy, the scaffolding's in place, the trades are there doing other jobs but they can fit the solar and electrical wiring is a clean sheet, there's nothing in their way. Plus, the cost of panels has plummeted. So I think we refer to this as a, a no-brainer. Now, our government has signed up to carbon agreements. Even Boris is now saying we will emerge from COVID and build greener. However, we then get mixed messages. We get reports that the Carbon Commission is considering taxing cows who break wind. So where is the real demonstrable action? The current planning system rules are inhibiting us from requesting that all future developments should be provided with carbon targets and a commitment to be zero by 2030. Only yesterday at DC, uh, a lighting scheme we've talked about actually at Tadley for an outdoor games area was discussed and members wanted to condition that the lights went out when nobody was using the site. Apparently, we have no policies in our local plan that would allow us to make such a small change happen, to save energy in such a minor and easy way. I mean, I sit on DC, obviously, and DC has no power. And this is the point of this motion. With this motion, I wanted much more, but legalities have watered the wording to what members have in front of them. But it will be a start. We as elected members must surely have the power to request such a change even requesting that through this council we challenge government. Locally, it's us who are responsible to achieve carbon neutrality. We as the council have, have signed up to it. So how are we going to achieve our goal? So I therefore commend this motion to members. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Ashfield, you're seconding this motion. Do you want to speak now or defer until later? Um, no, I'll just just to really want to take councillors back to 12 months ago when we all scrambled to get to delivering this motion and I had the great pleasure to and I remember that evening well. Um, we, we supported the climate uh, emergency motion unanimously. We talked a lot that night about being ambitious and, and radical and, and here we have an opportunity to actually start doing something. So I think we, we need to 
to really take ourselves back there. A lot's happened in the last 12 months, certainly in the last three or four months, but we really need to, to start focusing on, on, on the climate emergency. And this is a, a very um, practical um, opportunity for us to kind of put our money where our mouth is. So I hope this motion gets supported. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wholeheartedly support this motion and um, referring to the public speakers earlier, I think we should go further. Um, the recent fires in Siberia show incontrovertible evidence of man-made global warming and uh, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, we should be working in conjunction with the county and the government to get local schemes built right now. Uh, but this policy will be a good start in terms of getting um, private builders uh, and developers um, to incorporate energy efficiency right from the outset. But what I would ask my colleagues is, can we get some money from the central government? Um, and uh, if Boris has had his Damascene conversion to being um, pro-environment, I think we should uh, maximise that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Raphael. Madam Mayor, thank you. Uh, and can I thank the uh, members for bringing this motion because it is very timely. Uh, it's timely for on so many different levels, partly because we've been raising this with an EPH for the local plan update, partly because of recent planning applications. And sometimes it's only when we have significant planning applications and start to discuss them and wrestle with them that we recognise the constraints of our current planning policies. I hope that members will support this motion. Indeed, I think I'd almost put money on it that they will. Uh, and for it to go to EPH, where it can be discussed alongside the climate change strategy, which uh, I have insisted that not only will it go to CEP, but it must go to EPH as well. Our current local plan is serving as well. However, in one respect, it needs to be updated, and that is uh, in respect of climate change. How we create a more sustainable borough for the future in terms of energy use, in terms of heating, in terms of fuel for transport uh, and the methods of transport, as well as reducing the harm caused to the natural environment caused by our pollution and our population growth. So EPH will be uh, creating and supporting and uh, engineering a climate change policy uh, for the local plan update, which will become part of that uh, local plan moving forwards. Now, I've, as I've said earlier, it's important that we all understand uh, that we can only have an SPD that is supplemental, that's what it is, supplemental to a policy that is already in a local plan. Uh, an SPD can't pre be created when there is no such policy or no such specific policy in a local plan. And there isn't a specific policy within our current local plan, although there are policies embedded within our local plan uh, on race to biodiversity, sustainable use of water and managing flood risk and uh, design and sustainability SPDs that we've already got. But as all of us will agree, they are not going far enough and they simply don't uh, uh, address the problem far enough, as we know. So um, this is a good motion. It's timely. And I don't think anyone is meaning to criticise anybody by saying, why hasn't this been done already? Because as we all look back, if wind power generation, to take one example, when the local plan was formulated in 2016, as far as I was aware, was pretty negligible. Certainly by 2017, it had reached about 17% for the national grid's generation. And I believe it could even be substantially more than that now. That just gives an example of how things have moved on, how renewable uh, ways of generating uh, electricity and ways of uh, creating sustainable homes, the costs are coming down and things are moving on, as well as obviously public support for all of these things. And, and the, the one of the, I'm not going to say benefit, but you know what I mean. One of the uh, side effects from the virus is going to be the fact that we all are appreciating our natural environment, the purer air, the, the need to move about through bicycles and walking so much more. 
Uh, and I want us to capitalize on that desire in, in the whole way that we structure our local plan update. So moving forwards, and obviously, uh, as I've said, we can't have an SPD, but this must go to committee so that we can, as it were, start to shape uh, an SPD for the future as we develop and understand the policy that we're shaping for the future. But there are some things that we can do in the present moment. Uh, uh, Councillor Tristan Robinson mentioned about having an exemplar charter, and that is something that I'm going to discuss with officers, and then I will discuss with members if it is something that we can introduce very, very soon, setting out what we expect in, deserved, in terms of uh, more sustainable design uh, and the like. And the other matter that we can also uh, investigate, and I am looking at with officers, is uh, the use of an informative note uh, when we make decisions on key developments. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity that uh, where planning conditions could highlight the council's encouragement uh, for development uh, where it seeks to reduce energy consumption, carbon emissions and the like. And I think uh, it's within certain constraints, the Development Control C Committee can really now scrutinise whether developers are playing lip service to what we want to achieve or are actually embedding it uh, within their applications. So I don't want members to be disheartened. The pace of change is rapid. Our hearts are in the right place to a man or woman across the council. We're all moving in the same direction. There's a lot of hard work that will need to be dealt with that committee to get this detail right, because ultimately it's the detail that uh, in the policy that means we can hold developers to account. If we get it wrong, it will they will just walk through it if they can and avoid it. Uh, and there are other things that we are doing. I know that uh, the many down standard has been talked about and that is being developed as well. And I dare say the other things uh, are like uh, from other um, developers across the borough as well. We're, we're saying this loudly and clearly. This is what we want for the borough. And I want us to be an exemplar. And I have tried my best to demonstrate my uh, desire for this by some of the other things I'm doing, like the, the biodiversity improvement zone, the first one in the county, probably the first one in the country for one specific ward. And the amount uh, of support that we're getting from the natural environment groups uh, from around Basingstoke saying, this is what we've been crying out for, for, for ages and ages and ages. And from other people within other wards saying, when are we getting one of these? So, uh, it, uh, and all of these things are interlinked in the way we, we want to improve our natural environment, the world we want to improve the sustainability of the way we do things for the future. So. We're all pulling in the right direction. We'll all have different ideas uh, on how we get there. And one of the great joys <laughs> of EPH is, is we've got to condense that down into writing. So I'm looking forward to the challenge. Uh, I welcome this motion because it, it is expressing in great language because it gives us the flexibility to, for all of us to see in it what we want to see in it to pursue that same objective. So I urge members, Madam Mayor, to support it. Thank you very much indeed. That's great. Um, Councillor Tristan Robinson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a few brief words from me on this motion, which I completely agree with. Um, we must ensure that we deliver on our climate objectives and build the sustainable new homes for the future. As the Cabinet members just outlined, we're slightly hamstrung by the law and the MPPF and our existing local plan on this. So what we need to do is to take this, um, which I dare I say it, we all agree with, and we need to make sure that we're shaping policy for the future. We need to ensure that we are setting the ground running to create an SPD as part of the new local plan, encouraging those policies to come through in the new local plan itself, and make sure that we're prioritising a development charter. And that's what we want to see. What I want to do with Councillor Raphael is to make sure that we have a document that says to developers, yes, you've got the local plan, that is the baseline for what we'll accept in planning law. But actually, we want to encourage you to do these things. We want to showcase that this is what we see as exemplar development. And there's a quick quid pro quo for them, because dare I say, if developers are adhering to the policies that we have set as members, then they'll get an easier ride at DC because they, they know that they're adhering to what we've said that we want to see. And I see that charter as including 
carbon neutrality in construction. Whenever you build something, you create carbon. But why can't developers on set, on developments, plant more trees, biodiversity net gain, all of those things, and make sure that we reduce carbon used once you've created a house in the first place? No gas boilers, infrared or ground source heating, net biodiversity gain, reduction in water usage battery parks that feed into the grid and make sure that we're harnessing that energy through solar panels and feeding it back into that development when it needs it and making sure that we're looking at sustainable methods of transport so that we're looking at bike and car hire schemes this has a real benefit for residents and we talked about the housing strategy earlier because if we can get these sustainability points right at the outset, we stop residents falling into things like fuel poverty and struggling to pay energy bills. Because if the house is creating the energy in the first place, the resident doesn't always have to pick up the tab and that helps solve some of the social problems that we see as well. So I fully uh, support the sentiment of this motion and I think we should be pushing it forward as soon as we can within the bounds of what we can do within the law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Frost. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, well, what can I say? It's basically all, all been said by uh, Councillor Rappel and, uh, uh, and Councillor Tristan Robinson. Uh, but uh, as Chair of EPH, I'll, I'll, I'll be very happy to take this forward, okay, uh, and work with uh, uh, the two portfolio holders um, and see what we can do uh, in, in the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Gavin James. Thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome to the motion. Absolutely going to support it. Uh, it looks like the budget speech I wrote in 2009, uh, which many may remember, uh, is certainly not unusual for Lib Dem to stand up and say green energy investment is something the council should be doing. And clearly our, our local plan should have more green in it. Should have done last time. And I did try for that, but got as far as I could. I think the unfortunate thing is we talk about incorporating these green policies and strengthening them within our local plan and any SPDs we have. Um, but actually then we sort of lose sight of it and we don't carry on with it. The will seems to be lost. I'm in play, I mean, I see uh, Councillor Fells seems to have left, um, but uh, nice curtains. Um, but, uh, oh, he's back again. Uh, but Councillor Raphael uh, talks about uh, the investment in green energy, saying I've been calling for for years. Uh, I get the impression he's quite keen now, perhaps wind farms could go south of the M3 to prevent development. That's something we could look forward to working on together um, because uh, it's clear that that's the kind of area we can put such things. So absolutely support it, but we mustn't lose sight of it. I think what I would say is things do change, things move on. And as we look to review our local plan and put the policy, we have to somehow word it very cleverly that's future-proofed, so as development moves on, as technology moves on, as things advance, it's still relevant and we can still make sure it's getting the best possible results for the borough. Um, that'd be a bit of clever word, which I'm sure Councillor Raphael will come up with. Thank you very much. Uh, there are no more speakers, so Councillor Tomlin, do you want to sum up, please? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, great words. Um, thank you, everybody. It's the sort of thing we want to hear. Um, Again, I commend the motion, but I just say time is ticking. We've got to get on with it. We need to monitor where we are uh, and we need to look, well, I'm saying six months, but we need to see what we can do as fast as possible to help DC out. Yeah, I, we all are trying our part there. So yeah, I, I thank all the, uh, all the contributions from uh, councillors and of course our public speakers. Uh, that was very useful. And I think we all share this goal. So uh, thank you for your support. Thank you very much. And thank you everybody who contributed. Um, again, I'm detecting harmony and determination. Um, so I'll just give a moment. If anybody is not happy with this motion, could they raise their virtual or their actual hand? Thank you. So that motion is carried. Thank you very much. Moving on to the next one. Um, this is concerning libraries. Can I invite Councillor Watts to introduce and propose this, please? Councillor Watts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this uh, motion was originally in the May full council meeting, um, but we thought it'd be good to resurrect it now because as members are aware that the county are going to be making their decision in a, a couple of weeks time on, on the libraries in Hampshire. I mean, at the time back in March, we had consensus amongst the group's leaders where they stuck out a statement su supporting the free libraries we have in the town centre. So I thought it was a good time to resurrect this one and reinforce the council's commitment to supporting the, the free libraries we have in the town centre. 
in the town. Um, Baderstoke is already poorly served by Hampshire County Council in terms of, of libraries. I mean, if you look at the statistics for county councils with populations over 100,000, uh, we're, we're already in the bottom four. Um, so we're, we're already being under provided by libraries by Hampshire County Council. So, and if they were gonna close two of our libraries, that would just leave one library with a population of over 115,000 people. And, and we are the, um, the fastest growing council housing growth um, in Hampshire. And they want to cut our provision of libraries, which is just totally unacceptable. I mean, the statistics, I received some statistics from uh, the Friends of Chinnam Library. I mean, uh, they're a credit to their community and some really interesting statistics here about how poorly Hampshire are actually doing. Um, and even their alternative proposals put forward in reduction of hours. Uh, I mean, we would have the least accessible library provision in, in the country if those were to go ahead. So they're looking for cross party support. I mean, the, the South Ham Library has been there. It's only just reopened up um, on a, a Tuesday and Friday after the COVID. Um, and in the census, in the last census, um, South Ham had the, the largest elderly population and that particular generation are more book inclined than the uh, younger generation and it and it's um and it's a focal point of the community it's next to the west side community center which is thriving um and to, to close that or reduce the hours would have a massive impact just not on the, the residents of south ham it is it serves that particular side of the town and when the hampshire county council muted this back in the uh, beginning of the year we had emails from all residents from from oakley and and um out in the sticks there um that they actually use the library so it just doesn't serve south ham it serves the whole community um so i think we as a, as a council should unite and uh defend our libraries and um um move forward together and hopefully the county council will reverse their decision Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Grant, you're seconding this motion. Do you wish to speak now or defer to later? Yes, please, Madam Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Uh, back in February and March, I had many conversations with residents at Southam about the possible closure of Southam Library. I spoke to young mums down the school who told me they very often met with other mums after picking up their children and would walk to the library. I spoke to a young lad about 13 years of age who told me he uses the library for his homework because he doesn't have a PC or internet access at home. At a time when families are struggling to put food on the table, pay utility bills and keep a roof over their heads, I think buying their children books is sadly way down their list of priorities. We have to stop closing free, easy to access local public facilities. It disproportionately affects those families struggling already. But out of all the conversations that I had, one sticks in my mind. An elderly lady who was telling me about her weekly outing to the library, how she used to walk out her front door straight onto the bus and it dropped her right outside. Unfortunately, this bus service was cut. She now has to rely on family and friends to get her there. She has had her last bit of independence taken from her. Please don't take her library as well. Thank you. Made a speech, I think. Well done. Thank you very much indeed for that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Right, I have speakers. Councillor Michael Westbrook. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Madam Mayor, following the announcement in January of the possible closure of 10 libraries within Hampshire, although not in the same party as Councillor Watts, I telephoned in to discuss and offer my support against the impending closures, in particular South Ham within my division as a county councillor and his as a ward councillor. I will be supporting this motion for several reasons, and will mention just a few, having already submitted a full response to officers as the county councillor. Firstly, I'd like to offer my overwhelming support for, for our library service and a desire for it to remain, including those threatened with closure at Chinham and South Ham. 
South Ham is a library at the heart of its community, purpose built and readily accessed on foot by residents, an important factor to note having declared a climate emergency. And earlier today, Hampshire County Council adopted the Transport for South East Transport Strategy that marks a shift away from traditional planning for vehicles towards planning for people and places and is explicit in aiming to reduce people's dependency on cars. The Southam building is an impressive, roomy and well lit for a tier three library and although very currently considered undersubscribed by some, it has huge potential for its close connection to Westside Community Centre. The library's consultation stated that the index of multiple deprivation for educational attainment in South Ham at 5.9% is below the Hampshire average. My fear is that many children could be left behind if it were to close and we want to give them all the best start in life. With that in mind, South Ham Library as an easy accessible library has the potential to adapt to meet community needs, not be abolished. I disagree with the consultation assessment that this could be achieved through services delivered by a nearby library. Putting distance, time and a financial burden into the mix for families will do little to raise the index score for educational attainment. This is a Hampshire freehold building that in my opinion should remain to serve its community as a public service, perhaps with an expanded offering. That, that offering could and should complement the library and I've made that clear to the County Council. The South Ham Library building adjoins the Westside Community Centre as Councillor Watts has already said, formerly home to a Shore Start Centre. This hub is well used and very well known and familiar to my constituents and easily accessed by the whole neighbourhood. It's worth highlighting also the impact of future development on library services in Basingstoke. We have sites of a thousand homes at the golf course and 750 at Hounsom Fields, which already have South Ham marked as their school catchment area. Why not for their library needs too? It's much nearer than the town centre, meaning far less car journeys. Not to mention many down and east of Basingstoke developments and the Discovery Centre's ability to cope or future-proof. With South Ham to the west, and Chinham to the east, they will, need, they will be needed as vital library hubs for any future growth. 6.4% of households are without a car in South Ham, higher than the Hampshire average. And with the consultation suggesting that the Discovery Centre is the answer to everything, this will impact on families needing to take public transport at a cost of £3.80 or more. Drivers will have to pay for parking in town. South Ham Library is free. I know that families walk safely from Brighton Hill to attend rhyme time at South Ham. St Anne's school children are large users. Bishop's Challenger school pupils use the library as a safe place after school and parents pick them up after work. One mum told me her child makes the short walk from home to meet up with friends and have independence. And mums sit with very young children and read books, not something you can do digitally. These libraries threatened with closure are with an easy reach, with an easy reach Easy walking distance for many. Oh, I lost me, lost myself here, sorry. Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Can you still hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yeah, sorry about that. I pressed the wrong button on my computer. Yeah, so and with, so the library stretch and closure with an easy walking distance for many and with social isolation, a big worry for an aging population, as well as others, having a facility at the heart of a community will be essential to help combat that. Finally, Madam Mayor, at this difficult time when we're all still avoiding making any unnecessary journeys, Hampshire has just announced that in the first week since libraries have reopened, 5,000 customers have loaned 25,000 items, a point I hope that does not pass Councillor Woodward by when making his decision. And Madam Mayor, for the record, I will be attending Councillor Woodward's decision day in support of my residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very good to hear from Hampshire County Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vatigan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, as you all be aware, I was at my instigation that all uh, group leaders got together to oppose any cuts to the borough uh, library service for, for three uh, places. I have to mention Kingsclare Community Library myself. Um, Obviously, the threat to Chinnam and to, to South Ham Library are, are hugely worrying for our residents. And I agree the residents are, uh, our libraries are hugely important to our community assets. And the potential for greater community and voluntary involvement in delivering those services is well known. 
I've written to the executive member for recreation and heritage, um, trying to point out to him that libraries, while they were closed, uh, were sorely missed. It is it is remiss of them to to gloss over the fact that people use them for a range of services, for digital services. And I've highlighted the importance that libraries have as a center for learning and community activities, just as has been pointed out by Michael Westbrook and by Councillor Watts. Therefore, I've asked the, the executive member not to progress any plans for closure of libraries in the borough, or at least defer the decision, uh, as we've had a community involvement from friends of Chinham Library, uh, South Ham residents, and from the Kingsclare Community Library to, to ensure that the services are not diminished, but are enhanced and, and, and made better if by, by the people who work there, but also the people who use it. There is no, there's no uh, justification for taking away these facilities at this, at this time, especially as the vulnerable in our borough are feeling even more cut off than they did before the COVID things. So I will be, I will be pressing the executive member to, to rescind any decision to lose these libraries. And certainly we will do everything in our power as a borough to object to whatever they see fit in terms of cuts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jane Franklin. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I've, I've got you in the slightly the wrong order. Beg your pardon. I think I better be strict about this. Councillor Laura Edwards. Sorry, Jane. Oh, okay. Can you unmute, Laura? Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, so thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I wholeheartedly welcome and support this motion. The news that our libraries were at risk in January came as an unexpected shock. In the ward I represent, Chinham, our beloved library was threatened with closure. The community came together and launched a hu hugely successful campaign. The result being we have contributed to the largest ever response to a consultation held by Hampshire County Council. This would not have been achieved if it wasn't for the hard work and determination of the local community, Friends of Chinham Library. I would like to personally thank them for everything they have done. From day one, I was supportive of the consultation to allow residents to have their say and to show the local demand for the service. While I appreciate the decision must be based on facts and the consultation feedback is included, I disagree with the recent decision to consider the increase in people joining the digital library service over the past months. The increase is a direct result of the COVID-19 lockdown. It's not a true reflection of how many people use these services, more of a result of their keenness to use the facilities by individuals of all ages, especially children. I urge the County Council to take these stats out of their final report and to listen to what the residents want. The decision will affect young children today, tomorrow, and in years to come. It must be the right one. If our beloved library is deemed closed, in my role as a borough councillor, I'll work with the leader and other ward members to explore the options available to us with the local community and organisations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, councillor Jane Franken, and apologies again, Jane. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I'm very pleased to hear everybody is um, in agreement and they're in agreement with our with our residents. Um, people use it from every age group, and it's absolutely lovely going into into Chinham Library as I do, and you see the children there where they're reading stories to them, the joy in those faces. Uh, it's also a, a social centre where people go and meet. I've got one elderly gentleman who lives on his own and was totally lost when he when he lost his wife and he goes to the library and he really goes because he meets every you know a lot of people and can find out little questions about how can he cook this and you know all sorts of things it's not just about libraries and to close them i think is nothing short of foolish 
in fact, I'll go as far as to say bonkers, uh, which really is needed. We have uh, people from uh, Popley, and I remember not so long ago when they did a census that was up to 25% of households in Popley did not even have a book, but do go to the library. So it really, really is important that we keep it open. We don't cut the hours because you cut the services. In fact, I think uh, this COVID has made people more interested in, in libraries and going out and walking. And so we should be actually doing probably more hours, more activities. And I really, really do hope that Councillor Woodward listens to the people of Hampshire, not just Basingstoke and Dean, but the whole of Hampshire. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Regan. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I know um, Councillor Ragan's support, which is much appreciated. I also know that Councillor Westbrook's now going to support the number four going down Pallet Road to serve as the uh, library if it stays open. And also, the, the unfortunately, the, light, the West Side community, you know, like a lot of communities, is not thriving at the moment because it's a COVID. It's actually virtually shut it down. And, and the uh, Nikki Blunden, the uh, site manager, with a massive help from volunteers, doing a great job servicing the needs of the vulnerable local community. Uh, but moving on to about libraries, I mean, I've got lots of thank libraries for the, the um, I, I could not read or write until the age of 10 and uh, through ill health. And I used my mother used to take me down to the library at Lam Lambeth Library on the corner of Waterloo Road down the bottom of Taxi Hill in the Lower Marsh. It's not a library anymore, but and they got plenty of help actually to help me and I uh, to read and write actually through special help and special groups, which is a favoured one under the welfare state in the, in the uh, late 50s. Anyway, uh, I couldn't, I did not read a book until I was uh, 15, but I've not stopped reading since. Actually, unfortunately, because uh, I eyesight now, it's audio books, but I still love the world of books. And, and to shut libraries is, is taking that away from them. Uh, the libraries is not a, a profit or loss account. It's not a business. It's a public service. And unfortunately, we we not got here by by accident. We got here through ten years of cuts, of austerity, and and using it to volunteers. I mean, uh, the uh, the people of South Ham did not invest in in the uh, subprime market in Mississippi, uh, and, and they invest in debts, and and, uh, and brought down the crash in the, the banks. So. This is a long route from 2008 to 2009. Oh, I love your pussy, uh, Laura. And, and, uh, and so uh, it's, a, it's, a long, it's a long road of, of, from austerity and, uh, and to, to the austerity first. And I do worry significantly now, especially of COVID-19, uh, uh, of the, what the, uh, the reuse debts the government's are at to wrap, wrap up. It's, uh, we're in very, the libraries and public service and all communities, everything is in grave danger. So I'd still like to see, uh, obviously libraries are a good thing, a good thing in themselves and they're not a profitable organisation, they're a public service. And I want South Ham, especially, it's in a vulnerable area to stay open. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Jones. Did you did you say Councillor Jones? Did you? I said Councillor Tony Jones. Hello, Tony. All oh, right, fine. Okay. It's appearing as going as well. It must be an age thing. <laughs> no, I obviously I'd, I'd like to speak on this because it does affect my walk, which is hard. There's a little bit of a South Ham in there as well, and I don't want to go over the same things that everybody else has, but it has affected our children. They haven't been to school for half well half the year now. Now, when they do get back to school, they want to use libraries because they haven't got internet. A lot of people haven't got the internet collection or anything like that because there's a cost involved. <clears throat> it's easy to walk through, walk to from Buckskin. You can cut right the way across at South Ham Extension. You know, I think, we're, you know, as a, well, as a country, we seem to be going backwards. Who would have said 
10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we didn't start closing libraries. I just find it mind boggling. I, I, I'll be honest, I'd be ashamed if I was anything to do with Hampshire County Council. I know their costs have gone up of everything, but what we should have been doing, and perhaps we should have done as a council, is actually complained about the government's cuts. I don't want to go into the political thing, but when we start cutting theatres, we start cutting libraries, schools, there is something wrong. And it really isn't good enough. And I'm really pleased we've got a cross section from, from this council. It's hopefully everybody to support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last speaker, Councillor Gavin James. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's great to see the entire chamber uniting behind supporting libraries. If only that had happened uh, when we discussed this in the, the County Council meeting in Winchester over the last few years. The libraries are under threat for a strategy and transformation agenda that was approved by the Conservatives. Now, I, I have a lot of sympathy for South Ham because I know that Councillor Westbrook voted against that transformation agenda, as did I and Councillor Frankham. But we shouldn't forget that for most of you, you have a Conservative County Councillor who absolutely supported and voted for these cuts. So don't come on here and then uh, and, and say that you're so upset and upset about the fact that Tories are you're, you're, you're so upset about these libraries closing because you will probably go out in May and support the very people who voted for that. So you need to reflect on that. Actions speak louder than words. If you really want to save libraries, please make sure when you go out in May next year, you do not select the same county councillors, the Tory county councillors who have failed your communities so badly this time round. Thank you. So uh, there is one more speaker, councillor Still. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've heard members this evening talk very passionately about saving our libraries, and I hope they have all taken part in the consultation um, that went, you know, that's that's been there. I will be supporting this motion. I want to see our libraries stay open without a shadow of doubt. But I'm just saying I really hope you all spoke passionately at the consultation about saving our libraries in Basingstoke. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Councillor Watts, do you want to say anything by way of summing up? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm delighted we have cross-party support to, to save the libraries in Basingstoke and Dean and Kingsclear, of course. I think what uh, Councillor Stephanie Grant and Jane Frankham spoke about, these cuts will affect real people generally the most vulnerable people in our communities. Um, and it would be a, having a devastating effect on these people. These are real people with real needs and cutting frontline services like that would be a travesty. I mean, if we go back to the motion, I think it's just summed up in the, in the second paragraph. Libraries are a valuable community asset whose value cannot be measured in money alone. So I think that sums up the way we feel about libraries in Basingstoke. And I'm delighted that we have cross-party support and I hope Hampshire listens to the residents and listens to the borough. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, yes, I think we're all together on this one again. Um, just, just to reiterate, it's a two-part motion. One is to resolve to work with Hampshire County Council to save our libraries. And the other is to look at um, ways of identifying other uses of library for community facilities and other activities. Um, can I assume therefore, unless you raise your hand, that we are all in agreement on this one? Thank you very much, that is carried. So the final motion concerns the COVID-19 pandemic. Can I invite Councillor Kim Taylor to introduce and propose this please? Councillor Taylor. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, as you may have noticed, members and Madam Mayor, this motion is really a motion of uh, three parts. Firstly, it seeks to acknowledge the very significant and extraordinary contributions made by those volunteers, organisations and individuals engaged in the essential business of running our community and the health and well-being of our citizens, including our own borough staff. I know that other members may wish to contribute on this aspect, so I will not expand on that element further. I will say, however, that all of those combined efforts of those wonderful people will be for nothing if we do not act on the other two parts of the motion. 
The second part of the motion is that we must place demands on ourselves as local politicians, administrators and guardians of the borough to challenge wider government to ensure that we receive the power, information and support to enable us to manage the remaining phases of this pandemic and the rebuilding of our community and economy. Events such as Leicestershire demonstrate that local authorities do not always get the central support and information they need in a timely and effective way. Recent data from the Local Government Association shows that compared to near neighbours, our borough had a high infection rate and in some cases nearly double the rate per 100,000 residents than surrounding areas. So it is essential that we have the information we need for an effectively local driven rapid response. Other studies show that after housing costs, our local child poverty rate is still far too high and this situation will not have been improved by the impact of COVID. So with a funding black hole of billions facing local government, we must demand from central government that the funding we need to do our job. The weight of this particular burden will mainly fall on our leader and the chief executives and their senior teams, but it is the responsibility of us all to support those efforts of securing information and resources from central and wider government. Lastly, but not leastly, we also need to reflect on our local actions so far during COVID to acknowledge the many successes and also identify lessons learned and future actions we need to take. This reflection needs to be done in an entirely non-political and blame-free manner and include input from councillors, employees, external partners and local volunteer groups. Some elements of this re reflection may uh, take time and relate to longer term issues around uh, resilience planning and so on, but some will not and will need to be proceeded with with real speed and urgency. Where there are hurdles, barriers or deficiencies identified, we need to try to overcome them. For example, is providing funding to voluntary organisations sufficient in itself? Recent reports on social media have suggested that some supermarkets are banning food bank charities from stores because of their high demand. Could we be using our expertise and influence to help secure supply chains? Another example might be reviewing our plans for scrutinizing workplaces and other environments for COVID safety to reduce local spikes. With the benefit of hindsight, there are things that we might do differently now to support community centers, local care homes or small businesses. To undertake this important task of, of a review, we may need to adopt new and infinitive ways of collecting views and information at quite a pace so that we can renew our plans in dealing with the pandemic in good time. A second wave in the winter is being forecasted, which could result in as many as 120,000 deaths nationally. These reports suggest that the R rate could be as high as 1.7 in September, so time is very short indeed for us to make uh, opportunities for improvements and further action, 46 days and counting to be precise. So finally, Madam Mayor, to paraphrase New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinta Ardern, we must go early and we must go hard on our review. If we do nothing, the worst case scenario will, would simply be intolerable. It could lead to more loss of life in Basingstoke and unmet hardship for many. Therefore, I urge members to support this motion and I hope members will use this opportunity to thank the efforts of our community and to contribute ideas for topics that should be considered by the scrutiny committee as part of their review. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Simon Bound, you're seconding this. Do you want to speak now? I'll speak now. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Madam Mayor, I'm sure everyone in the Chamber has been humbled by all the people who have both continued on the front line and those that have joined them during this global pandemic. It is right that we thank them in the way of this motion and I applaud all the initiatives to thank them in other ways. From this week's Place to be Proud of Awards and of course Madam Mayor, your very own big thank you from the 10th to the 14th of August. I'm sure your hunt for heroes will have many nominations as we have so many living amongst us. 
This frontline work has been essential during lockdown and we are also starting to realise how much we will need to do by some of the same people to support our recovery and the future impacts of this pandemic. Work on the front line has never been more vital or more appreciated and reviewing what has been done so far and what we can learn to do differently is vitally important. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor McCormick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to uh, Councillor Ruth Cooper, uh, who's still recovering from the virus um, some three months after her discharge from ho hospital on April the 5th. Um, and uh, also consider our officers and family members um, who have been affected uh, by the virus. Um, and there have been councillors um, in other parts of the country, and I'll mention three that I know of, uh, comrades of mine, uh, Frank Rust of Rushmore, Shabnam Sadiq of Slough, and Pat Midgley of Sheffield, and I'm sure there are many more uh, who've lost their lives in the virus, and we're not out of the woods yet. Um, and there are many um, organisations that we could pay tribute to. I suppose at this point I should declare an interest because my fiance works at the hospital, but the hospital has been absolutely outstanding. And I'm really pleased that that uh, three aspects of what they've done really well have been cited as examples of best practice. And I hope we can extend that to other local bodies uh, and pass that on. Um, the thing that's really worried me, and I'm sure I'm not alone uh, in this has been um, the care homes um, and uh, the, the kind of sense of being on the outside, not really knowing, uh, but suspecting that they've been having a really tough time on it. And I wouldn't want to apportion blame at this stage, but as a council, I think it's one of those things that we need to consider uh, better connections with, you know, key, key care providers and also transport workers as well, because they were particularly at risk. And it was one of the first um, regulations for wearing a mask was on public transport. Following discussions with other group leaders and officers, um, I'd be happy for the move of the motion to consider a slight amendment um, to allow for referrals to CEP and EPH um, relating to any items supporting our communities building the council resilience and um, helping our businesses out of lockdown and breathing new life to our economy. Thank you. Thank you. So um, we've had Councillor McCormick propose an amendment. So can I ask Councillor Kim Taylor and Councillor Simon Bound if they agree with that? I'm happy with that, if uh, Councillor Bound is. Yes, I am, Madam Mayor, thank you. Okay, um, now, um, we, we, need, we need to just um, add in to the proposal that this is these issues will be referred to CEP and EPH for consideration. Is that sufficient for you, Councillor McCormick? Uh, or Councillor Taylor, sorry, I should say. Is that correct, that we're adding into the recommendations that, um, Councillor McCormick, can you say again exactly how you'd like it to be worded? Uh, I think additional referrals to CEP committee for um, items relating to support for our communities and building council resilience. Um, and to EPH relating to helping our businesses out of lockdown and breathing new life into our economy. Okay. Items. 
Okay, so we're adding in um, that in addition to what is recommended in the motion, we are recommending referrals to CEP for items relating to our resilience. And yeah, planning. we'll CEP resilience. support for our communities. I, I, I wouldn't want to tie us down with specifics, but... Relating to support for our communities. Okay? Yes. And yeah. building council resilience. And to EPH yeah. um, relating to help businesses in lockdown and breathe new life into our economy. Is that okay? Is that understood? And is that yeah. okay, councillors Taylor and Bound? Councillor Kim Taylor, is that okay for you, that wording? Yes, that's fine. No, no, I think we're both nodding so that to save time, but I think we're both happy. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm obviously not going to take that to a formal vote, but I'm going to ask you to vote by raising your hand if you're not happy with it uh i would ignore i would ignore the ones that the hands that were already there which is council cousins court george and Kinnear. oh councillor james and potter right i'll take it that everyone's happy with that amendment so now we'll return to the substantive motion uh, with that amendment added to it and I'll ask Councillor Cousins, please, to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I want to thank the mover and seconder of the motion. And indeed, my contribution is on uh, what Councillor Taylor said in regards to rebuilding. Um, as much as retrospection is needed, we need to do some forward planning as well. That will mean asking some difficult questions and considering some unpalatable circumstances. Well, the Council has its Horizon 2050 document as its blueprint, not even we considered an event quite like this. While I know that officers will be working hard on this already, I feel it's incumbent on all 60 of us to contribute to this debate now. For example, with the rise in home working, many will want to continue to do this. Um, therefore, what can we do to help facilitate improved broadband to our residents' homes and particularly those in rural areas? Similarly, should businesses to decide to reduce or leave offices within the borough completely, how do we balance the loss of rents, business rates, as well as the knock-on effect to local independent stores? Looking at retail, how do we improve and encourage people to stop using internet shopping and deliveries and head back to our town centres, retail parks, village shops and other retail units? How do we make sure shop owners, businesses, uh, and people with these jobs keep their jobs, return, flourish and grow? And do we want vacant shops to become homes? One of the side effects and one of the benefits of this crisis has been the improved air quality and we will want to do our best to make sure that this is maintained. So we need to make a real effort to re resolve and get right our transport pitfalls. While appreciating that we're not the transport authority, there are things that we could do, such as fully committing to our park and ride scheme and even introduce things like park and pedal to encourage cycling. We could also look at more electric car charging points and particularly focusing on residential areas where there are no dedicated off street parking. We should also not be afraid to challenge Hampshire County Council for improvements to our bus services and ask them to help us build a proper cycling system that is safe and joined up. Well, the government has said that councils will get all the help they need. We need to be prepared for the worst. Should we only get a proportion of our losses, how will we recoup that distance? Do we hike the fees and charges our residents pay for things like bulky waste, football pitches and cemetery spots? Or do we try something new, unique and innovative? These are just some of the issues that we need to start thinking about and resolving quickly. So while I support the motion wholeheartedly, I just want to make sure that within our review and our scope, we do think about the things that are right in front of us and that we need to help tackle and start thinking about quickly. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Councillor Court. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I think we owe a lot of people a huge debt of gratitude I would, however, like to put on record the work of a particular charity in the borough. 
At the start of the pandemic, Inspero stepped up very quickly and promptly with their volunteers and they started a, I call it a shop, but I mean, it's for anybody in Buckskin who wants to go along and collect food that needs it. And they operated out of the Ridgeway. They operate for anybody in Buckskin, Kempshot, Southam, Brighton Hill, Hatch Warren and Beggarwood. Twice a week, the centre is open at the Ridgeway. On once a week, on a Thursday, they deliver, the volunteers deliver food parcels to those elderly and those who are shielding or vulnerable and need food and can't get out to get it. Along with the food, they also include hot meals to those requiring a hot meal that can't provide it for themselves. Because Inspero is a healthy eating charity, they also insist that all parcels contain healthy foods and quite often they supply the vegetables that are freshly grown at the Inspero garden at the village hall, thereby carrying on with their ethos of healthy eating. Part of their volunteer team have also made scrubs and face masks. They also go and collect prescriptions for those that can't get out. The list goes on and on and on. I'm sure I've missed something out, but I'm sure it'd be well worthwhile putting them on the list as a consultee when all this is looked at at a later date and ask for their advice on how they've done it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor George. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just really, I, I'm just following on really from what uh, Councillor Cord was just saying there. Um, you know, I very much welcome uh, Councillor Tate's recognition of the efforts of so many of our communities during the COVID-19 crisis. It's just been fantastic the way they've, they've done things. Um, you know, the Whitchurch Ward, which, uh, which I represent, is probably represented many in our borough, um, but I, I, I really hold it as a, a prime example of what community really means. It's uh, um, you know, there's been so many people, volunteers, so every diverse religions, backgrounds, um, ethnic groups, and even political groups, all working together. It's just been remarkable to see that all, all coming together. And it was really a truly a community effort during this last period. Um, frankly, they came together, they identified those that were vulnerable, um, they looked after their mental health, their fears, um, and they, they met their needs, you know, mm. deliveries and everything else. It was just absolutely wonderful. I, I do take on board uh, Councillor Cormack's point, though. Our nursing homes were, were, we managed to support those at a time when formal help through the uh, Hampshire County Council Local Resilience Forum was just not forthcoming. You know, they were considered to be private sector and they would not support them, frankly. And I think we really do need to look at the lessons of that and, and how we support those. If we have to go through a further, a further um, you know, lockdown period or what have you, or, or, or period of uh, further COVID, we, we need to really look at how we can help those. Um, but you know, these, these people, and the staff and the members of the, and the people living in these, these nursing homes are our community after all, we really need to work with them. Um, really, these roles that went Forward. The things that were done in which were just remarkable, actually. We had the All Hallows uh, group with Andrew and Alison Ricketts, you know, visiting uh, teams, providing comfort and reassurance to people. We had the Witchers Community Support Group, which was set up by Fiona McDonald. It was remarkable. They set up a complete Facebook site uh, with helplines and everything else to listen to people and what, work out what's needed and who's, who's uh, needed help. Um, they uh, the owner, Mohammed Mustak of Blue Ginger, just literally just out of nowhere said, right, come on, who needs hot meals here? And, and donated over a thousand meals to NHS staff and nursing homes and vulnerable members of the community. And the neighborhood care team uh, led by Andrea Willey organized delivery of all that, it was remarkable. The Welfare Trust provided funds for people who, who fundamentally just didn't have the resources and money to do things. And the Methodist team took over local deliveries to the food bank. And, you know, that's just a mention of a few. I'm sure there's others out there. Um, really, what I'm saying here in lots of ways is, is this, is, this is the way the community came together. We need to, to support and learn from them uh, and, and involve them in our decision making going forward. I think they've done a tremendously good job. And I'm proud of the generosity, dedication, resourcefulness of the communities that did this. Um, I think this uh, idea of a big thank you is a great idea. 
we, we can give them recognition, but I think, uh, it, you know, I, I think uh, we need to, to talk to these groups and involve them going forward, possibly through the BVA going forward. But I think they've done a great job and we need to lead and learn from them. And if we do go through a second wave, take on board what they've done and how they've done it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I hope all these wonderful people and organisations you're all mentioning will get nominated for the big thank you. Let's get as many in there as we possibly, possibly can. Um, now, just a minute. It's coming up to half past nine. Um, would you agree for me to suspend standing orders just so that we can get through the programme? But we have to finish in any case by half past ten and we will be finished long before then. Are we all agreed? Agreed. I'll look for hands who aren't. Okay, thank you very much. I'm assuming you're okay with that. Councillor Kinnear, would you like to speak? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we have had, we have to thank all volunteers for giving up their time to help isolated residents living in rural areas during lockdown and local suppliers for keeping everyone fed and watered as many relied on local stores rather than driving or struggling for delivery slots from the larger supermarkets. In the Kingsclear Ward, which I represent, thanks must go to Raj and Monica at Swan Street Stores in Kingsclear and a team of 53 local volunteers who during lockdown delivered food to many rural areas, helped pack the shop shelves, unpacked delivery lorries and acted as door monitors. Thanks also to the Kingsclear Butcher and Chemist who arranged deliveries to many isolated residents and McCall's who delivered newspapers. Headley Village Community Shop provided rural residents with supplies and orders with a local team of volunteers. Local rural pubs provided takeaway meals and offered a delivery service to many isolated residents. This service was much appreciated in rural villages where there is no shop for many miles. A Hannington resident made face masks for Swan Street store shop volunteers and for local isolated residents free of charge. She is still making masks, but now asking for a donation to go to St. Michael's Hospice Bathing Soap. Many residents have said that they will continue to support the local rural shops rather than drive to the main supermarkets in the future. We have to thank them all. And many of these people I have already submitted to Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Gavin James. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We're supporting the motion in its entirety. Uh, I just wanted to mention uh, some hidden heroes. Uh, they're not actually volunteers, they're actually employees. And that, of course, is the ones that often go, they get mentioned. Um, and those particularly who work in Hampshire's largest care home, a care home full of people who have anger management problems, mental health problems, substance misuse problems, can be very volatile, can be very violent. Um, when you work in a place like that, to try and get rules like social distancing to work when they're sharing cells that are two metres wide, it's very, very difficult. Uh, you try and get them to stick to the rules where they're in that place because they break the rules. Um, working in HMP Winchester has been a real challenge during the COVID time. I'm so pleased I wasn't in there at this time uh, to work there. But um, those who have have done an, an incredible task trying to keep those people safe where, as I say, they share everything. They share banister rails when they walk through the, uh, the building. They share showers, they share bathrooms. There is no social distancing. It's very hard to wash your hands every couple of minutes when you can't really have alcohol in the cells, alcohol gel, because of what might happen to it. So a really tough place to work. We forget about it, it's hidden from us. Whatever you may think about what prisoners deserve, clearly those who have to support them, work with them, uh, deserve our gratitude for the enormous tasks they've undertaken. Um, they are outnumbered massively by these prisoners, so they have to keep them on board as well. Uh, a real tough task, and I wanted to pay tribute to them publicly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Potter. It's actually uh, Councillor Laura James. Sorry, my internet went down tonight, so I'm sharing. Um, okay, thank you. I can make a personal thank you, really, to all of those volunteers who work within Northern through the Spotlight Centre, who went above and beyond, and at the last minute would come out delivering food or delivering money uh, or services needed. And, and they were incredible, absolutely incredible. But I particularly um, want to make reference tonight to the Food and Furniture Project to um, work tirelessly <coughs> through this time 
and actually what they did is um, they supported those homeless, street homeless, in providing furniture and delivering furniture from uh, uh, New Haven in, in the system. And the New Haven and this new here some delivering furniture to house vulnerable people. Um, and what I can learn is, um, is that um, we do not really call funding a bank to do this organisation. And so I would want to ask us to speak to what is actually to look at some of these voluntary organisations who do not fund. Um, but people who have now not, not receiving their parcels and have major thank yous and they would have been able to get through this time if they hadn't had those few parcels. Um, I'd like to think, uh, my council, my first problem has to be a kind of funding that they gave to the county. Um, I'm afraid we've lost Councillor Laura James for now. Sorry, Laura. I'm afraid your sound wasn't terribly good. Um, I'm afraid we'll have to move on if that's okay. We've got just a few minutes left of this motion. So um, I know everyone wants to say about the wonderful work going on, but if you could, if you could speed through it a little bit and put your nominations in for the big weekend, uh, for the big week, sorry. Um, Councillor Capon. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, before, I, before I say anything, I just uh, feel it's, it's important to um, declare an interest in the sense that I work for one of the organisations mentioned in this motion. Um, and I thank uh, Councillor Taylor and Councillor Bound for making reference to Basingstoke Voluntary Action in the report, in the motion, I should say. But um, the reason I wanted to talk is because um, I feel it, it important to uh, stress the, as many other councillors have done this evening, um, the enormous effort um, of the volunteers, the hundreds and hundreds of volunteers um, that have come forward during this, this crisis. Um, and so I welcome this motion uh, for it to be reviewed, for their work to be reviewed by scrutiny and CEP and EPH uh, committees. Um, it's been really humbling to see the level of partnership working between various authorities, Hampshire, us as a, as a district council, as well as all the voluntary and community groups. And I think it shows a real blueprint for the way forward to support our community. Um, I wanted to just uh, very um, quickly as well, pay particular tribute to the dedication and hard work shown by our officers um, during all of this, um, this crisis, particularly sort of under the leadership of Ian Bowl, um, Samantha Charlton and Daniel Garnier in particular, uh, as senior um, leadership members in the sense that they have really reached out to our voluntary and community organisations and helped uh, make the um, recovery and the, uh, the efforts that have gone, gone on in the last few months um, possible. We've seen over 20 community hubs across every part of the borough step up to the plate with hundreds of volunteers and um, on behalf of, of in my role as a councillor but also um, working in a community organisation I'd just like to say a heartfelt thank you to every single one of them um, and uh, yeah look forward to the future ahead and the outcomes of the uh, the scrutiny and CEP and EPH um, uh, work so hopefully it offers a blueprint for how we can do things in the future thank you thank you very much and thank you for all your hard work with BVA they did a brilliant job and I'll continue to do so uh, Councillor Jane Frankham thank you Madam Mayor um, I would like to thank um, our officers and I'd also like to thank all the people. I've just said, if anybody in Popley wants to donate some toiletries, um, the uh, hospital were desperate. Um, it, people from villages from everywhere came, including Madam Mayor yourself. I finished up with a white van, absolutely jam packed full and four carloads of toiletries and have had um, one since then. So went to all the, all the hospitals, but it's impossible to, to thank everybody because people just, I don't know who, who came, um, but there was thousands and thousands of pounds worth. Also, 
Um, I'm sure you're aware of a, a group called for the Love Scrubs. The hospital actually were ordering scrubs and PPE equipment that should have been provided elsewhere. I'm not going to get political here, um, but it, it was a shame that um, they had to do it. But they did nearly 5,000 pairs of scrubs for Basingstoke, Winchester, Alton, care homes, doctor surgeries, masks, all sorts of things. And they're still doing it. They're still doing it now. I think if we all put into to what you've said, the, the big thank you. Otherwise, we're going to be here till 12 o'clock because there were thousands of people that helped. I just think we have a fantastic community. Thank you to the whole community. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Yes, I mean, we could be here all night if each of us lists all the people who we really do revere over this time. They have been brilliant. Uh, if we could just speed along a little bit now because we're getting close to the end of our time for this motion, that we're probably just about there. Um, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. First of all, you know, it goes without saying, I think everybody said it, thank you to all the people, you know, the bus drivers, people working in the shops, everybody in the borough for doing their bit. But what I wanted to highlight was about flats. One thing with this lockdown that's come up is we've got families in flats, no gardens, no outlook. We should be looking at our policy. We had it years ago where we never put families in flats where there was no gardens, so they couldn't get out. And I just wonder, just saying that it's one thing we should be looking at when we're housing young families to make sure they get houses with gardens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Gardner. Thank you. I could name individuals all night, but what amazed me was when we put our hub out, we said, people that need help, please contact us. And we were swamped. We were swamped with volunteers offering to help. So I think as a borough, we actually have a wonderful group of people and every one of them deserves thanks for the efforts that they be prepared to make to put themselves out at this time. Thank you so much. And we all heartily agree with that. Thank you, Roger. And finally, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Now, can I echo everything that's been said thus far and thank everybody for doing everything they've done thus far. Um, this isn't over. Uh, and, and there are so many people that continue to need help and support. And, and there are many vulnerable people out there that are relying on services day in, day out to get through. And, and we should acknowledge that and, and seek to support them as much as we can going forward, as well as thanking everybody for getting us this far. Um, just picking up on Councillor James's point in regard to the furniture project and thank them so much for what they've done in our ward. I mean, the furniture project, dishing, um, putting together food parcels and delivering them to very vulnerable families, supporting our homeless with uh, furniture and, 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 and kitting out homes that otherwise would not have been. So that work to make something very real and very tangible for people to get through this has been very, very important. And in reviewing what we might do, for example, with the furniture project, we might want to consider as a council, well, should we be charging them a full rent for the use of their property as a charity? Let's think about these sorts of things for the people out there that are doing the support for us. So there's things like others have said that we can consider to support going forward, that perhaps we should. But a huge thank you to everybody who's done everything amazing work, absolutely amazing work uh, to some of the most very vulnerable people in our community uh, that's needed it. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much and thank you everybody. Um, Councillor Kim Taylor, do you wish to say anything else just at the end? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think in the interests of, of time, uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for their contribution and um, if it occurs to anybody that they have particular topics that they think that we should be reviewing um, in scrutiny to see how we move forward and make improvements. Uh, can they get in touch uh, as soon as possible? Thanks. Thank you very much. And I think I can be confident to say that that motion is carried. Thank you very much. Uh, right, we just now have two questions. And uh, the first one is Councillor Konieska, Konieska. 
Yeah, sorry, I'm, it's getting it's getting late. Uh, would you like to put your question to the cabinet member for borough development and improvement? Thank you, Thank you Madam Mayor. Um, as per the order paper. Mm. So that's Councillor um, Bean. Yes. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and may I start by thanking you for your question. Um, I can confirm discussions between the Council, Basron, Sport England and all other affected parties regarding the development of the Camrose facility have been conducted as part of the planning process. It's the responsibility of the developer to submit a proposal and the responsibility of the statutory consultees, including Sport England, to assess the proposal to ensure that suitable facilities are re-provided to mitigate for any loss of sporting facilities at the Camrose site. The Healthy Communities team has no direct influence over the planning decision and nor should they. All comments received by the Council's planning team on the Camrose proposal can be viewed online on the planning portal. As the local planning authority, it is the Council's role to remain impartial and to assess each proposal independently. For England, as a statutory consultee and the experts in this field, has assessed that the required mitigation and this is also available to view online on the planning portal. The council is in receipt of the planning application for the redevelopment of the Camrose site. The local planning officers are in the process of assessing the planning application, which will be de determined by the Development Control Planning Committee once the assessment of all technical matters is completed. Sports England are a statutory consultee on the planning application with the assessment needing to address the loss of playing pitch facilities and the need for acceptable mitigation to be provided with improvements at Winklebury. While our planning officers continue to work with Sport England and the applicants of the planning applications for the Camrose site, our priority is to enhance the facilities at Winklebury Football Complex to allow the club to play in the borough as quickly as possible and other clubs to enjoy improved facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have a supplementary? I do, if that's uh, if that's acceptable. Yes, yes so go ahead. Could, um, could, could the, the, the portfolio holder clarify if the council is in any discussions about potential alternative sites um, outside of Winklebury um, for a, a long-term sustainable home for the club? Thank you. Um, thank you for your supplementary question. Um, the planning, as I've stated already, the planning process um, is still underway. Um, comments regarding mitigation can be found on the planning portal. And if there are any further questions around that, they do need to be directed to the planning team. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the second question, which is from Councillor Gavin James. Uh, his question is for the Cabinet Member for Planning, Infrastructure and the Natural As Environment. As per the order paper, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much, Councillor O'Fell. Madam Mayor, I'd like to thank Councillor James for his question. Uh, as I've said previously with this permitted development, uh, uh, it's the law of unintended consequences. Uh, what is good uh, sometimes has to be balanced uh, with uh, means of uh, uh, remedying things that were unforeseen. And we made representations on the, uh, previously uh, about the fact that there's a lack of access to open space and, and other things uh, with the previous uh, proposals. Um, so we'll have to see what uh, the detail is in these proposals and uh, we'll make the appropriate representations if they ever happen. Thank you very much. Councillor James, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, I do, Madam Mayor. Uh, the portfolio holder may not be aware, but yeah, actually you are aware uh, that we've recently completed a 250 home 280 home development under permitted development rights in Eastrop. And unfortunately, because it didn't go through the planning process, no one thought of putting a bin store, uh, an appropriate bin store in that development, which kind of gives you an idea of the problems that can occur. Uh, we now have open air bin stores outside people's flats blowing rubbish across the whole borough, which is lovely. Um, now, the government have already announced that as of the 1st of August, Regulation 20, and I'm sure you're, you're fully up to date on the um, Country Planning Permitted Development Miscellaneous Amend Amendments Regulations 2020. Uh, Regulation 20 means that we can now have permitted development rights to add two storeys to any block of flats that's more than three storeys already, but less than, going to be less than 10 storeys overall. So we're going to have more problems. 
So in the year since you moved your motion to give yourself authority to request that the government stop, stop the permitted development rights, we've had a development with no bin store, and now we've got more development coming. Um, what else can you do? Or is your government completely failing you and us? Well, I don't think the government's failing you. I think you're very lucky to be under a Conservative government, uh, I would say, Madam Mayor. But the fact, the fact of the matter is uh, that uh, we will judge each of these things as they come. And uh, I, I do hope, uh, Madam Mayor, that Councillor James has written to uh, me and to the planning policy manager with chapter and verse on these things, because those messages have not yet reached me, because I like to have evidence when I go and meet the minister to explain the unintended consequences. And if he hasn't done so so far, I'd invite him to do so forthwith. Thank you very much. Right, moving on now to agenda item 21. Questions to the chair of cabinet and or a committee. We've got the minutes of the four meetings listed on the agenda. They've been published. Are there any questions arising from these? Councillor Regan. Yeah, to uh, regarding the uh, CEP meeting uh, as per minutes, we uh, th we had a, a, uh, on the Camrose issue, we had a, a, a delegation from the Camrose Football Club, and uh, one of them, Mr. Miller, su uh, suggested that maybe the council should should take over the uh, or purchase compulsory the uh, the football ground. I mean, that struck a, a, cold, a light in my eye because that would stop the horrendous link road and blocking off of uh, Western Way. The link road would put 500 cars per hour past the back gardens of Western Way without any uh, soundproofing. And, uh, and the football ground could be uh, then redeveloped, uh, stop the horrendous flats that are being built. We just heard about flats. I mean, the, the flats are continually keeping out of the... Uh, out of the area would not meet the local needs, uh, but but uh, but developing the football ground, uh, retaining ownership, council could buy it, and then lease it back to the club and it, and develop it for local sports uh, clubs, etc. And uh, so I was very disappointed that the uh, Rebecca, being the cabinet member, totally dis disregarded the the uh, the, uh, the idea uh, before she received the report from. Uh, the CEP, which is coming to us in September. So uh, I ask her to reconsider it again and use some political, is it political will, knowledge, ambition, and, and some vision. All it takes is political will. You can hide behind every rule in the book, but all it takes is this, this development of the uh, football ground for all of the community, all of the community, and not, not for a, a certain developer. And, uh, and I feel sorry for the people, if this goes ahead, and also we lost the, uh, the underpasses at Brian Hill Roundabout, pulled through under emergency powers by the county council without any defence from the county council, as we set to our own one, uh, uh, who agreed to the link road and the actual uh, the roundabout. So I uh, asked the, uh, our chair to hurry up with, uh, to, to speak to his colleague in the cabinet and for her to consider the uh, purchase of the football ground. Thank you. So, so thank you, Councillor. Your question, therefore, is will you reconsider the compulsory purchase? I assume that must be to the Cabinet member. Councillor Bean, do you want to say something? Um, yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. That was obviously quite a lengthy question. Um, I am, in the interest of time, happy to provide a written response um, confirming why we won't be looking at that again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor McCormick, you have a question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Council, 25th June, um, question two, page 15. Um, our recycling banks are in an appalling state. Several sites across Basingstoke, Brighton Hill, Winklebury, Stratton Park, um, Sherbourne Road. Um, it's fairly self-evident that the increased number of slots that the county have announced are insufficient. Uh, would the portfolio holder agree to look into this with a view to 
taking some necessary urgent action, um, including, if necessary, um, dedicating some additional tip space, because it seems at the moment we have a number of satellite tips uh, that fill up every week with stinking rubbish, uh, where it should be just recyclable materials in the bottle banks and tin banks or whatever. Thank you. Is that for Councillor Eaches? Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam yes. Mayor. Thank you. Um, yeah, totally agree with what you're saying. The bin banks are an issue. I am on it. I speak to officers most days about it, and we are working with Serco to look at some additional capacity. Um, obviously, uh, I know some of the private ones have closed, like Morrison's, but I'm definitely doing everything I can, and hopefully we'll get some movement soon. And at the same time, there are also more letters and more pressure being put on county about the booking system. I welcome it because I think it makes the traffic so much better. But now I'm getting lots of emails saying people can't book there. So I, you know, I, I do what I can with that, but it's not our service, but I am putting the pressure on and doing all I can. So I'll keep you up to date with the bring bank issue. Thank you very much. Councillor McCormick, you want to say one other thing? Just forgot to mention, would the portfolio holder consider putting CCTV on some of these sites uh, to identify the culprits? Yes, some, again, absolutely. It was one of the conversations I was having with the head of service yesterday. Um, it's just infrastructure and, I mean, cost we can obviously look at, but it's finding the infrastructure. I mean, pure example is Morrison's. Um, we actually ended up after a while working really well with them because they've already got the infrastructure for the garage we went to all the hard work of, of installing it and then the um the it wasn't a great picture so they were in the process of dealing with that and then obviously lockdown happened so it's, it's something that i totally agree with but it's just um the reality of putting it in but again it is things that we are considering and bring banks should be something in due course and i know there's so much going to committee so it might not be for a little while yet but it should be something that's coming back there in the future as well thank you very much uh, councillor gary watts um, you have a question which meeting does it refer to cep on the 24th madam mayor okay. Go ahead. thank you it relates to the actually resolution of the committee um on that particular meeting and where they uh, they commissioned the report to come back in the September, and the report states that it should the options to purchase the land at the Camro site, the possibility of moving the club to a new location, and the list of locate locations that may or may or may not be suitable, but the portfolio holder has just ruled all those out. So, what is the purpose of having a report if they're not going to look at any options? To maintain the Grade C facility at, at for Basingstoke Football Town. Um, can I offer that to either Councillor Gaskell or Councillor Bean? Uh, I'm happy to take that, Madam Mayor. Um, as I've stated already, um, I am happy to provide a detailed written response uh, in terms of why we won't be looking at that. It is for the applicant of the Camro site to deliver the appropriate mitigation. Therefore, the council will not step in and remove that responsibility for them. There is a planning process to be followed here in terms of securing the appropriate mitigation for the Camro site. Thank you. Can I have a supplementary? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, it surely is the responsibility of Basingstoke and Dean Council to support sports within Basingstoke and Dean. So we as a council should be looking at alternative sites within um, the local plan agreement that is coming up, the review. I noticed on the agenda for the last meeting of EE, EHP that wasn't even on the agenda looking for a new stadium. Surely we are delegating, we are not delegating, we are not holding our responsibilities to the football club to looking for a map of for a say grade C like for like sports facility within the borough. And one last thing as well, I never question 
Um, can we secure the current Camrose site? Because it has been vandalized daily by yous as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sabine. Do you want to incorporate all that in your written answer? Um, yes, I, I mean, I can do. Um, just in terms of the, the future needs and our commitment to sport, we have spent considerable time working with the club. We are investing in Winklebury to enable the club to come back to Basingstoke and for the wider football community to be, to um, benefit. In terms of future provision, obviously we need to redo the LRNA, which will start to feed into the local plan process in terms of what's required for the future. And your point around securing the site, it is the responsibility of the applicant. However, I am happy to take that away and come back to you in terms of whether there's anything we can do to try and su support that. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions on those agendas? No? Okay, so there are no confidential or exempt items, so that concludes our meeting. Thank you all very much for your participation and cooperation. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Mayor. Mayor.